Good morning. Welcome to the National Security Innovation Network's Defense Entrepreneurial Symposium, otherwise known as the DES. ANSON, that is the acronym for the National Security Innovation Network, and our delivery partners for this symposium, the Nebraska Business Development Center and the Small Business Development Center at the University of Missouri Extension, are honored to bring you this annual symposium. I am Wade Watts, ANSON's, National, uh, Ansons University Program Director at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and I will be your host for today. Please be aware that this symposium is being recorded in its entirety. The recording will be made available to you within a week. We are fortunate to have an overwhelming response to the symposium. 540 people have registered for this national event, which just 18 months ago started out as an Omaha only symposium. We have a total of four ecosystems across the nation. We will discuss that more in detail soon, participating today. Uh, those ecosystems are the University of Nebraska at Omaha, Washington University in St. Louis, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and University of Hawaii at Manoa. To get started, I'd like to go over a few administrative notes through the following slides. First, our objectives. Why are we here? We're here so that we can increase innovative solution development within the Department of Defense. If we can't get that done, then we've failed. We want to introduce you, our audience, to all the Ensign programs in our acceleration portfolio. So what that means in plain English is, these are Department of Defense innovation business opportunities. Uh, and we want that to you, our audience, whether you're a business, an investor, an entrepreneur, a small business or a startup. Now let's talk about navigation through all these uh, different things here. So up at the upper left hand corner of your screen, you'll see a menu. And all these things bring all these different links bring exceptional uh, capabilities. First of all, so our expo hall will start up immediately after all the presentations are done in the main portion of the DES. And uh, you can get detailed information on 13 of our, uh, 13 of our presenters. Uh, some of these booths, as we call them, expo booths, are static, meaning that uh, you go to them, you can download information, you can send an email to uh, that particular vendor and ask questions. And then others will have live Q&A sessions and chats and things of that nature via Zoom, WebEx, or a variety of other interfaces. Next is our survey. We want to find out how you feel about your experience here today, both the good and the bad. Now, it's a quick survey. If you spend more than three minutes on it, you've done something wrong. Unless you want to write a tome like War and Peace, you can do that too. But this is a quick survey. The next thing is the DES community. Now, this is a big deal. So people might think, hey, the event is all about all these presentations. Well, that's just getting us started. The event is about uh, establishing communities, communication, and collaboration. So through the DES community, which if you haven't signed on ever to, the, to this uh, website, which uh, belongs to Ensign, uh, you will be able to collaborate, trade information, uh, ask questions. You'll be able to have access to all the different slide presentations that were given here today. And then lastly, you can contact us at Ensign directly and ask anything and everything your heart could desire. Now, I'd like to remind everybody that this whole presentation everything in the symposium is being recorded. So let's talk about this year's uh, DES. We have a total of 35 different presentations. You know, we'll go over an overview. You'll see some presentations about services that are available for you to view and interact with uh, throughout uh, your experience after this DES closes down uh, and, and find out what's available to you. Uh, different companies and vendors will present their uh, capabilities to you. There'll be some testimonials and then some special presentations. 
Again, we have 13 expo booths and five venture capital investment firms presenting, which is new this year. We haven't done this uh, before with the uh, investors and uh, the financiers. And uh, just so you know, there are a bunch of financiers who are not presenting today who are out there in the audience. So I specifically welcome you and, and are, I'm grateful that you're here. We're all grateful that you're here and participating. Okay, so next up, uh, we are excited to have the Honorable Tashara Jones, Mayor of the City of St. Louis, give our keynote address today via pre recorded video. Just last week, Mayor Jones, in honor of this symposium, declared this week through a formal proclamation to be National Security Innovation Week. Now on to Major, excuse me, Mayor Jones's keynote address. Good afternoon, I'm St. Louis Mayor Tashara O. Jones and I want to welcome you to the 2022 Defense Entrepreneurial Symposium. St. Louis is a city of discovery, from Lewis and Clark to Twitter founder Jack Dorsey, iconic rock star Tina Turner to Anheuser-Busch, from T.S. Eliot to the ice cream cone. And St. Louis is a city of connections, a big city with a small town feel where everyone knows their neighbors, their neighbor's extended family, and which high school each and every person went to. We're a city with a firm sense of right and wrong, the city where Dred and Harriet Scott began their fight for freedom and a quiet leader in the civil rights movement and fight for equality. St. Louis is a hardworking city, a tough city, half Southern charm and the other half Midwest grit. We face our fair share of challenges for sure, as any other metropolitan area in our country does. But with a $1.7 billion NGA West Campus being built just north of downtown, I truly believe that St. Louis is at the precipice of a transformation that will reshape our city in the years and decades to come. When I ran for mayor, I ran on a simple vision. I want St. Louis to win again becoming a place where anyone can thrive, no matter where you come from, your zip code, or any identity you hold. And let me tell you, there are thousands of the top innovators and experts in geospatial technology, innovators in mapping and satellites and satellite imagery, artificial intelligence, and more, all eyeing St. Louis as the place to be for future security innovation. The sheer pace of innovation in this industry is thrilling to see, and the future home of geospatial being built right here in the Gateway City, St. Louis is an incredibly advantageous location for geospatial to build, innovate, and grow. The St. Louis region is rich, is a rich, diverse hub of talent in the Midwest. Our city is constantly rated one of the best in the country for startups. New economy tech startups like Square and Balto are choosing to base themselves in St. Louis, and it's clear why. It's an attractive and affordable destination for people looking to get ahead in their careers and raise a family. Let me tell you, our world-class universities, top-tier medical systems, thriving innovation districts, vibrant art scene, 108 beautiful parks, and the most enthusiastic sports scene in the country, paired with our low cost of living, your dollar goes far in St. Louis. We built something special here in St. Louis, and I'm excited that you're here to join us in the pursuit of a more innovative future. I'm proud to proclaim the week of August 8, 2022 as National Security Innovation Week here in the city of St. Louis. Congratulations. Take care and God bless. Well, welcome back, everybody. We're pleased to have that presentation by Mayor Jones. Now I'd like to give you an ensign overview. Ensign, the National Security Innovation Network, is a member of the Department of Defense. We build networks of innovators to generate new solutions to national security problems. The idea here is, and you'll see me repeat this over and over and over again, is that we have a network, nationwide network of people who work, canvas, uh, and, and communicate 
to Department of Defense entities all across the nation. We find out what their problems are, uh, and then we innovatively bring in uh, people from all across the nation. It could be entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, uh, companies of various uh, sizes, startups, even universities to work on these problems together and, and solve them. The important thing here is to get intellectual diversity, get access uh, to people who normally wouldn't work with the Department of Defense to solve problems. As I mentioned before, we have people all across uh, the nation. So these are our university partners here on this particular uh, diagram. Uh, you'll see they go all over the United States. We have both uh, university program directors or UPDs as we call them and regional directors. And I'll discuss what that's all about here in the upcoming slides. As I mentioned before, Ensign is a member of the Department of Defense. And we report to the Under Secretary of Defense for research and engineering through the uh, Defense Innovation Unit or the DIU. We became an official program of record in fiscal year 20, though we existed for a couple of years before then uh, under various auspices. Now, the great thing about all this problem solving for the Department of Defense is it's all free to our clients. Uh, they don't pay a dime. Uh, the expenses for this are borne uh, by Ensign. Now, as I mentioned before, Ensign communicates and collaborates and partners with universities, so the academic community, as well as uh, the venture community, which includes, of course, startups uh, and financier and uh, entrepreneurial firms. And then uh, work, we work with the national security apparatus as a whole, basically the Department of Defense, to find out what the challenges are that are out there and then bring everybody together to solve uh, those challenges that are out there. Now we're headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. We have 33 regional positions across 20 states. So this gets into the university program directors of the UPDs I talked about earlier. We've got 21 of those sprawled all throughout the nation. You'll hear me refer on and off to a thing called the beauty of the network. We are networked. So if uh, a unit or combatant command, say on the East Coast has a problem and the best people to solve that problem are located on the West Coast through our network, we hook, uh, we hook those people up to the appropriate university or businesses and uh, we start working the, the solution. So here are our regions. And then within each region, you have uh, various uh, UPDs. And these are the, the UPDs work with the main colleges we have an interface uh, to and with. And then the regional directors, it's not a hierarchical thing, then the regional directors work with universities that aren't assigned to the UPDs. So this represents a, a new model for national security innovation. And we at Ensign divide all of our work into three separate portfolios, national service, collaboration, and acceleration. The acceleration portfolio is what we're going to be talking about today during the DES. Okay, so that involves all of our business oriented uh, generated solutions uh, through entrepreneurs, again, uh, startups, small businesses under 500 people and the like. So I'm briefly going to go over uh, those three portfolios. And then Abby Desjardins, uh, the acceleration portfolio director, will give you a quick overview of all the acceleration programs we have in detail because that's what you're interested in. That's what you're here for. So here are our programs of record. I'm not going to go over each one of these things in detail. Uh, what I am going to do uh, for you is uh, to show you where some of these programs and things uh, interconnect. So let's start off with collaboration. These are problem solving uh, activities. Notably, I wanna talk about Capstone and Hacking for Defense and Hacks. Uh, Capstone and Hacking for Defense are part of our academic oriented uh, programs. So we work with undergraduate students as well as graduate and postgraduate students, and they work on uh, 
these problems that the Department of Defense has. Uh, within capstone, that's uh, incorporated into capstone classes uh, near the end of a student's uh, academic degree sequence, and they work uh, problems. Hacking for Defense is a little bit uh, more intense. Uh, those classes are completely dedicated to solving DOD problems, can be composed of a number of different teams, and we use a process called the Mission Model Canvas, uh, started by Stanford University. Uh, think of it as an agile technique on steroids. Uh, this combined with a whole bunch of interviews that the students conduct to find out more about the problem in detail uh, allows them to uh, get a better idea of how to solve that particular problem. Then we have hacks. Uh, hacks is a big deal. It's open to not just students, but it's open to small businesses, anybody who wants to participate. It is a competitive uh, program where uh, one uh, problem is put out there for everybody to work, and then everybody comes up with their own solutions. The solutions are evaluated and ranked, and the top solutions buy for cash awards to further develop a solution. Now, what does this have to do with acceleration? Well, the, the nexus here is the, the key intersection point is many of things that come out of the collaboration uh, result in uh, the formation of new companies to work on uh, DOD problems or just working with companies that exist out there and uh, they work uh, new problems. And then that gets us over into our acceleration portfolio, which Abby will describe in detail in just a few moments. So let's talk about the, the power of the network and or the beauty of the network and some numbers. From 2019 to 2021, for a small, relatively small amount of money, yes, I know it's $95 million and that sounds like a lot. Uh, for that amount of money over those few years, look at all the things that have come out of this. Uh, Ensign has helped 909 Department of Defense, DOD organizations saw 963 problems and cranked out 1,366 solutions. To do that, we engaged over that period of time, 6,925 people. 370 new companies were developed as a result of working all these different problems. So what does that mean for you in this community attending this conference? So here are two really big important numbers. 5.5 billion, with a B, uh, dollars were raised in private funding with the DOD providing another $1.1 billion in funding. That's pretty impressive. So. Does this sound interesting to you? I sure as heck hope it does. Uh, these are great numbers and they speak volumes about what we can do together as an overall community to solve Department of Defense problems. Leveraging innovation, getting new perspectives to look at problems in a fresh way and coming up with great solutions. So, that's it for this particular uh, area. We're going to go over to Abby Desjardins, uh, the Portfolio Director for Acceleration, and she's going to describe each of the Acceleration Portfolio programs to you in detail. Hello, my name is Abigail Desjardins, and I'm the Acceleration Portfolio Director at the National Security Innovation Network, or ENSIN. ENSIN is an office within the Department of Defense, Research and Engineering, and has a mission to build networks of innovators and problem solvers to generate new solutions to national security problems. All of our activities at ENSIN are focused on tapping into communities of problem solvers who have typically been out of reach by the department. This is based on a fundamental belief that we're in a complex, rapidly advancing world and the rate of change and innovation within the Department of Defense is not keeping pace with our adversaries. We believe that if we, the Department of Defense, want to maintain resilience, leverage emerging technologies, and solve problems differently, then we need to incorporate new problem solvers. We recognize there exists amazing talent and technology within our universities and communities, both inside the Beltway and far outside the Beltway. 
And we should make a more deliberate effort to identify, assess, and accelerate access to that viable, feasible, and desirable solutions and the talent behind those solutions. For those of you unfamiliar with Ensign, we have two distinct but intertwined functions. We have the regional network team and the program team. The regional network team is geographically spread across the United States, leveraging a hub and spoke model. The 11 hubs identified as the regional centers of gravity are staffed with the regional director, who's responsible for understanding and developing the regional ecosystem. The spokes are staffed by a team of university program directors or spoke directors who are focused on bringing Ensign programming to the local ecosystem. We currently have 20 university program directors and two spoke directors. On the programmatic side, Ensign offers three lines of programming via a portfolio structure. Our programs are built to provide support to the services and OSD for any problems across an incredibly broad spectrum from the hyper tactical to policy and beyond. There are a lot of innovation organizations that are pursuing solutions to the big problems, the grand challenges that the nation faces, things like AI, 5G, and hypersonic. Ensign works on these things too, but we also believe that the small challenges that our service members face every day in completing our mission deserves just as much attention. We want to know what makes our service members not want to go to work in the morning, and if we can solve those problems, then we can enable our people to be more effective and efficient. The National Service Portfolio creates pathways to inject new talent into the Department of Defense. Within this portfolio, we have a variety of programs and pilot programs spanning the gamut of matching and bringing academic subject matter expertise to DOD problems to a fully paid government civilian fellowship program for STEM talent to be placed in congressional or DOD offices. The collaboration portfolio integrates new communities of problem solvers. The collab programming hosts problem solving collision events designed to put problem solvers, war fighters, and pr fresh perspectives from both in the same room to solve problems. Rank positions and title are left at the door while participants' creativity is set free. It's within this portfolio that we offer Hacking for Defense, which is a university course credit class that takes DOD problems and injects them into the US top universities to see what solutions uh, teams of students come up with over the course of an academic semester. And last but not least, we have the Acceleration Portfolio, which works with, and in some cases develops, dual use early stage ventures to address capability gaps. I'll focus on this portfolio in the next few slides. The Emerge is one of our pilot programs, seeks to establish T2 partnerships with universities to spin out new dual use ventures based on existing university intellectual property that correspond to the DOD's urgent critical areas of technology development. We're thrilled with the level of interest in this pilot program. We received over 223 teams nominated by 18 universities across the United States. And we're very excited to watch these talented teams navigate their path towards bringing transformative solutions to the Department of Defense and the commercial sector. We just concluded the second cohort for this year and have started making plans for the next fiscal year. The Foundry program takes technologies that have already been uh, that have already seen significant investment and development from the DoD labs, pairs them with teams of entrepreneurs who can commercialize the tech and bring a dual use company to market through licensing agreements. We have strategic partnerships with the DoD labs to identify the most relevant technologies that meet urgent needs in the services and the national network of entrepreneurs and innovators eager to turn critical technologies into viable dual use startups. To date, we have identified over 70 pieces of technology that have dual use potential, but more importantly, commercialization potential. We've seen 26 companies form out of the program in the last two years and are tracking over 40 company formations over the last five years. The companies that have participated in this program have gone on to secure almost $9 million in DOD funding and almost $6 million in private capital. The Propel program partners with commercial dual use accelerator programs to run targeted accelerator programs on a specific DOD problem set. Typically, we work with TRL four to six solutions and look to help foster a better understanding of the DOD customer needs through customer discovery sessions, along with sessions on how to prepare your business to do work with the department. We've helped over 95 companies through this program. They've gone on to secure over $105 million in DOD funding and over $105 million in private capital. At least two of the companies that we know of are on track to become programs of record within the Department of Defense. 
Starts is our showcase event, which features new talent, new ventures that have solutions typically tier L6 or higher that are in demand by a specific DOD mission partner to address a specific problem set. For example, we just concluded an event for combat feeding. They came to us looking for solutions that can sustain the American warfighter. Specifically, they were looking for solutions that include food preservation, stabilization, and densification technologies, and foods that support human performance or optimize gut and immune systems. We're really excited about this one. This was a very interesting starts program for us, uh, and we will have announced the winners on July 25th uh, for that particular starts. And finally, Vector. This is our program designed to offer Ensign alumni, teams, and really early companies who have participated in other Ensign programming an opportunity to participate in a dual use accelerator program where they receive education on how to do business with the department, opportunities to refine their pitch, and exposure to larger Ensign network through showcase events and mentoring sessions. Applications for the fall cohort of Vector concluded, and we are about to kick off the cohort. The company you see here profiled is a fun story. Three college kids with passion and an idea and a strong desire to do something other than remote learning during their first year of the pandemic. They have since gone on to secure NSF funding and are pursuing a commercial contract to deploy their solution on vehicles as they begin their life in New York City. The final slide here today is the Ensign by the Numbers slide. What you'll see represented here is the total impact of the companies that we have gone on to work with, the DOD mission partners that we have engaged with, and the number of solutions that we've brought to the Department of Defense. And if anyone here has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I have two email uh, addresses listed here, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions or field any concerns that folks have. And with that, I'm done. Thank you for having me. So now you should have a better idea of all the acceleration oriented programs that Ensign offers, uh, which is a great thing. So next up, we have Mike Bynum, uh, who is a principal for FedTech, one of Ensign's delivery partners. Over to Mike. Um, well, yeah, I, I appreciate you having me here. Um, you know, FedTech has been uh, partnered with Ensign, you know, since the beginning of Ensign, and then even before uh, it was Ensign, it was MD5, um, and uh, we we started with what we call startup studios, where we bring technology from uh, federal research labs and combine those with entrepreneurs in order to spin out um, new ventures. So uh, where we're at now uh, is, you know, we're a delivery partner for Ensign. Uh, we've delivered the national uh, or the Defense Innovation Accelerator, uh, which is now called the Foundry Program. Uh, we've also uh, helped manage some hacks, some hackathons that that Ensign has put on as well. Uh, and we like to say that we are uh, we act as the entry point into the Ensign ecosystem. Uh, again, imagine you know an entrepreneur just starting with a technology from DoD. Uh, and then one year, two years later, blossoming uh, to go into other instant programs like Maker uh, and, and like Vector and other accelerators. Um, you know, outside of Ensign, uh, you know, FedTech, we've got not just startup studios, but we have accelerator programs. Uh, we also have internal innovation programs where we'll go into different organizations like um, like Army Research Lab and others, and and help inventors be more entrepreneurial. Um, and then last, we have our, our corporate venture section, where uh, our corporate partners are looking for different technologies, uh, whether that's in startups or in federal research labs, uh, that we help them find as well. Uh, but long story short, all of this started with uh, our partnership with Ensign, and, and super excited to be doing that today. All right, now these next few videos will be testimonials. And what's important to remember here is we have people that go through Ensign programs and either form companies or they've gone into an Ensign program uh, with companies already formed, maybe they're brand new. 
and they're looking for direction and things of that nature, and we provide that direction uh, for them. And then uh, they go on to do big and great things uh, with the Department of Defense solving problems. So first up in this series of testimonials is William Monroe with Analytical AI. All right. Hey, welcome. Uh, and uh, thank you guys so much for, for having me uh, so that I can talk about the Ensign Propel program and just uh, how great it's been for our company. Uh, my name is William Monroe. I'm a senior data scientist with a company called Analytical AI. Uh, we are an early stage company out of uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, so I'm a technical guy with the company, but I know enough business to be dangerous. Uh, so I've been our primary liaison with the Ensign Propel program. Um, a little bit of background about analytical AI, just to put us in context. Um, as I said, we're an early stage company. We're in the middle of a funding round. I can't speak too much to that, you know, being a technical guy. And I'm happy to direct anyone to our CEO, Mark Froelich, uh, that might want to talk about that. But uh, we use AI or artificial intelligence as a force multiplier to make the world a safer place. Uh, so anywhere where there's a camera, a sensor that might sense something that is gone amiss, uh, we can use our AI uh, to improve that, make the process more robust. Uh, something we like to say is if a human can see it, then we can train an AI to see it. But the AI is always on and you don't have to uh, uh, sit there and monitor it all the time. And we work with DHS, TSA, um, and we have deployed algorithms at Customs Border Patrol and in testing at TSA. All right. So real quick here, the, there's really a few big things that we got out of the Ensign Propel program. Um, it really is something where you get as much as you put into it. And uh, we benefited from the contact, the mentorship and the accountability. So it, with the contact, we got direct conversations with subject matter experts and it wasn't just us talking about solutions or them talking about problems, but we really got to kind of do a, um, a mind meld and understand their problem uh, in a deep way and build a proposal out of that. Those type of relationships are really difficult to come by and cultivate otherwise. Um, the second big thing that we got out of it was mentorship. The cohort support team provided uh, valuable lessons during the learning sessions about uh, contracting with government, as well as specifics for uh, the specific area we were in, which was Air Force SBIR contracts. Their feedback ranged uh, from general to nitty gritty. And we really got a lot of guidance, really good feedback from them and help. Um, and then lastly, we also got a lot of accountability from the program. So it was scheduled out in a structure that helped cut through our calendars and really helped us get the most out of the program. As a result of the program, we now have contacts in the Air Force and we are also in the process of submitting multiple direct to phase two SBIRs. So thank you so much. Hi, welcome back. As I mentioned earlier, you'll see a group of testimonials throughout the DES here today. Uh, some of them will be from uh, what we call X-Force Fellowship uh, participants and students. Uh, these could be graduate or undergraduate students who have gone on a summer internship uh, working full-time uh, one particular uh, DOD problem. And so I want you to be aware if you see somebody saying, hey, I'm from X-Force, you'll know what that is. Uh, so you'll see force participants uh, talking about their experiences throughout the entire DES today, just so you understand. So next up is Anastasia Ramig giving her testimonial. Hi, my name is Anastasia Ramig. Um, I'm a junior at the University of Alabama, double majoring in math and physics and minoring in Spanish. Um, and this year I am a part of the X-Force Fellowship. Um, I'm working with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. 
um, with a virtual team of two other interns. Um, and just the X-Force Fellowship has really been an incredible experience. Um, when I was looking for internships, you know, I wanted something that was going to give me real world experience um, with, you know, the Department of Defense or government, just being able to apply what technical experience I've already gained in my classes um, and really see what those real world applications look like. Um, and I think that, you know, the fact that the X-Force Fellowship takes real world Department of Defense partners and helps them bring in younger perspectives to problems that, you know, they may have been having for years, um, but also takes the, us interns and gives us challenges that are not made up. You know, there's something that are going to have a real world impact. Uh, I think that's something that's really incredible. And that's really what drew me to the x -Force Fellowship. And so throughout my time here, I've had the opportunity to work with the NGA on a really incredible project uh, that I'm really excited about and has given me a lot of passion for my technical field outside of just what I'm learning in the classroom. And on top of that, I've had the opportunity to work with students from all over. Our team is spanned across all three time zones in the United States. So we're working from California and St. Louis and North Carolina. Opportunity to meet so many different people and see how our experiences can come together to solve the problem that we've been given has been just a truly amazing experience. Um, and on top of that, getting to get to uh, travel with the um, X-Force Fellowship and come to St. Louis and really see what the NGA does in person, um, but also meet my team uh, and have the opportunity to create some really great relationships um, and really understand what the future of the geospatial uh, field looks like. Um, and just have all of that understanding given to me through the X-Force Fellowship um, for, for my future and knowing that, you know, this is something that can really push me forward into a career in not only intelligence, but just my field in general. Next up is Ratika Tejwani, who is also another Ensign alum, giving you her perspectives. Hi, my name is Ratika Tejwani, and I'm a second year undergraduate student at Washington University in St. Louis, originally from Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, I'm currently pursuing a joint major in computer science and business and a minor in political science. This summer, I worked as an X-Force fellow for, for the National Security an innovation network as part of the NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, and to begin with why I chose X-Force, um, I've always seen that, um, I've always seen that people who contribute to um, community service and national service have this idea of giving back to their community. And I think um, that's been really interesting because every single person is a different individual and comes from completely different backgrounds, but they still have this shared interest of giving back to their country despite those differences. Um, and I think that's always been a common concept in my mind and I, I wanted to explore national service in that way. And X-Force felt like the perfect fit because I got to engage with my interests in political science, computer science, and community service. Um, I think for our project itself, what we're working on is being able to analyze high dimensional um, network graphs and be able to embed the network graphs into a lower dimensional metric space that still preserves the object's structural features. Um, and so our goal is to be able to take in large social network graphs or military intelligence networks um, and be able to create an algorithm that can identify and characterize structural features of social network graphs and embed them, like I said, into a large dimensional space for further interpretation. Um, and we wanna be able to deploy this algorithm at, against new network data sets as they come in a very efficient manner. Um, and so I've been working with two other interns and Dr. Martin Smith from the NGA, who's a research and development scientist there. Um, and the experience has been really rewarding just because it's a really good balance of being able to um, get guidance from Dr. Smith, um, teamwork with the, the other two interns, and also a lot of self-learning and self-directed learning. Um, and so I'll just look up videos for machine learning with graphs online um, and just look, listen to the lectures and, and learn from it and be able to apply it against our code data sets that Dr. Smith guides us to use. Um, and I think one also other really rewarding part is being able to travel to, we actually visited St. Louis where we got to meet a lot of NGA directors and members. Um, and that was really helpful because 
in any in any um, field, networking is a big part of it. And I think I was able to talk to a lot of startups, for example, Scale AI, um, and be able to understand what they're doing with government contracts, um, but also be able to talk to high level NGA members and talk about how their work um, revolves on a, on a small level as well as a high level. Um, in terms of how X-Force has helped me with what I want to do in the future, I'm really interested in learning how to use artificial intelligence and machine learning systems to extract data sites for applications and automating business processes um, and for enhancing national security and intelligence systems. I don't have much previous knowledge or experience in government work, but I'm really excited to ex further explore how the NGA uses high dimensional network data sets um, to analyze threats, improve military strategy and combat support. Um, and another big thing is aiding in humanitarian and disaster relief efforts. Um, I would also really be excited to explore how startup work um, and how automation can play a really big role in accelerating startup growth. Um, and so in terms of that, I think X-Force has been the perfect fit for me, both knowledge, um, content, and networking wise. Um, and I'm really excited to see where it takes me in the future. And welcome back. Next up, we have a, a video that talks about the Scandalaris Center at Washington University in St. Louis, where we just happen to have a university program director uh, by the name of Mike Sieper from Ensign. And now the video. Ensign has been working with WashU for a few years now, and we're helping bring together a network of innovators in academia, industry, and our mission partners in the DoD. What we're doing is building this partnership uh, to be able to establish more opportunities for students to be able to work with DoD. My name is Chris Ramsey. I'm the Associate Director of the Scandalaris Center uh, here at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and we are very proud and, and lucky and fortunate to be connected uh, to Ensign and to Mike Sieper specifically. We have a, a great connection with Mike. He's a former Scandalaris uh, team member, uh, but often his new role. And it's just great to stay partnered and, and to be partners with an avenue for innovation entrepreneurship that we want to shed more light on. The experience with Ensign has been phenomenal. And it's fascinating for um, a student who knew nothing about the Missouri Guard. And now here we are, fast forward four months and how much they've come to understand and learn about it just from their interviews and research that they've done on each of their projects. X-Force Fellowship is an opportunity for students to work directly with mission partners. And that is funded through the National Security Innovation Network and allows us to be able to bring together mission partners and students and show what they can do to solve problems. I heard from another state who had used Ensign in the past about how you could apply to be able to be partnered with a university who would help study a Department of Defense problem and present a solution. And so I went online, applied for the program, and was accepted to do not only the Hacking for Defense program, but also the Capstone. And then this summer, we will also continue to participate with Ensign on the X-Force Fellowship. Uh, I'm ultimately really excited. I'm going off to South Dakota. It's gonna be a new place, new experiences. Uh, even just going to Ellsworth uh, Air Force Base, I'm gonna be able to just have that experience of uh, working with the Department of Defense, build my confidence up as an engineer with personal experience. It's fascinating because the students not being in the military themselves have a completely different perspective of what we're trying to do. And so because they have a whole different way of looking at it, they're coming with different solutions that we may never have considered before. But um, just bringing different minds together to, to help problem solve has been uh, a great experience. We've been looking for an opportunity to create an Airman Against Drunk Driving rideshare application for a while for Whiteman. And we got connected with Mike Sieper at Ensign, and he introduced us to the team here at Washington University. Uh, it seemed like a really good fit, and we really wanted to find a way to create a modern tool for our airmen to use to get home safe at the end of the night. But I think this is an application that could be a transformational actual capability for the entire DOD. But you know, one of our goals in Scandalaris is that we're hoping that some of these ideas that are being presented today go beyond just a class project. 
Uh, that's always our hope out of the Scan Alert Center is that these are ideas that aren't just for a grade, uh, which is fine, uh, but these are ideas that hopefully can be gain traction and be scaled up and, and be put into use. And that's obviously the ultimate goal. WashU is a great institution. We want to be able to bring in faculty, students, and everyone that is developing something special that can help our warfighters. So that means taking WashU IP, being able to commercialize that, uh, ways that we can get that into the hands of the DOD and DOD IP into the hands of great innovators and entrepreneurs. So we want to be able to establish a network that is beneficial for everyone and to be welcoming and inclusive of everyone that wants to get involved because there's a lot of problems and we want to be able to have the best minds to solve them. So by now, you should have a pretty good base about how Ensign solves problems for the Department of Defense and how you have a big role in this, our audience. We really appreciate you being here. Now, we're coming up on a break, and uh, we'll break. the break will end at 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Central. That's on the hour. So if you forget everything I've just told you about time, on the hour, please come back. And then we'll start our services presentations, uh, getting into all the different uh, organizations that can provide you with information on how to get started with uh, some Ensign programming support you might need as you uh, do this. So that's it for now. I will see you on the hour. Thank you. Welcome back from the break, everyone. So now we go into the services presentation. Now I'll give you an idea of some of the other firms that are out there that can assist you as you engage in a trek towards Ensign Enlightenment, shall we say. Uh, so coming up, we have the Small Business Development Center, which by the way, is a nationwide organization that has outposts everywhere. Uh, Mr. Russell Combs from SBDC in Pennsylvania and Ms. Cynthia Yamasaki, uh, will be uh, presenting, she'll be presenting from uh, the Hawaii SBDC, and uh, their video will be coming up shortly. Good day, everyone. Hi, I'm Russell Combs. I'm lead consultant at the Duquesne University Small Business Development Center, Center of Excellence for Technology Commercialization. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to be here today and speak to you on uh, one of the very special uh, attributes of an SBDC, and that is the Center of Excellence for Technology Commercialization. And my counterpart in the Hawaii Small Business Development Center has already uh, presented and spoken with you folks, I think, and has given you an overview of the SBDC and what we do and how we handle things and who we're sponsored by, which is the SBA, of course. And so I want to talk to you about concept commercialization, the special part of the Center of Excellence. The objective of the Center of Excellence in technology commercialization is to assist the technologist in evaluating his or her idea and business model to see if it's commercially viable and to get the project or the product to market. There is no other objective. It's hard enough as it is, but take heart, the fun is just beginning when we get into this. There's a process and within that process, there are 10 primary markers that we look for, for a technology-based business to get to the market. The first, of course, starts there, but it's a million steps to get to it. Number one, is the idea viable? Is it unique? Is it disruptive? And what I mean by that, and I really want to stop for just a moment and focus on that, many good inventions and many good technology improvements are just that, improvements. But if you're going to bring a new technology to the market, especially from concept through commercialization, there's a lot of steps and there's a lot of parts and pieces to it. So we really drill down on, is it viable? Is it unique? 
And will it really cause a disruption in the market? Will people pay for it? Is there a market need? Also, is there a team? Do you have a team to make this happen? Very seldom can you take a new technology or a, a new invention to market unless you have a team with you. Most technologists, when they come to the SBDC Center of Excellence, they do have a team with them. Some don't. And that's another attribute of the SBDC Center of Excellence. We, are, we can be one of your team. Where in the process is the technology at this time? What I'm saying there is, is it just in the idea stage or do you have a prototype? And if you have a prototype, how far have you taken the prototype? We'll work with you to determine all of those stages and we'll work with you to get it from napkin stage or the idea on the paper all the way through to market. Is there a plan? And if so, how far is it developed? This is the famous and infamous business plan. I always stop here when I give a presentation because business plans are probably the, the most hated or, a, or feared entity in commercialization. But it's one of the most important. And the most important part of a business plan is not just the idea of for the funders, as you hear so many times, or for the intellectual property aspect. It is to prove to yourself that what you're doing is worth it because there's a lot of hours ahead. And the more you plan and the more you do your research and the more you get ready for every step the right way, the more opportunity you have for a successful launch of your technology into the entrepreneurial world. What protections are on the idea? And what I mean by that, with intellectual property, there are different coverages and different phases. We'll walk you through that. Do the numbers work? I'm a numbers guy. And true business success works around the numbers. So many times, great ideas do not come to fruition because the numbers don't work. And what I mean by that, it may cost way too much to ever launch it. It may not cost enough to launch. It may be so complex in the parts and pieces and engineering that it just doesn't meet what the market needs. We're going to work on those numbers and we're going to figure that out so that you don't dive into the deep end of the pool only to find out it's full of piranhas. Who's financing the journey to the market? And what I mean by that is, are you financing this out of your own pocket? Or are you going to the bank and asking for traditional funding? Maybe an SBA guaranteed loan. Are you going to go to angel investors or venture capitalists? We'll walk you through each and every part of deciding which one is the best for your journey. What is the company aim for the technology? Many technologists that are wanting to commercialize their technology find out that it is much better to license it than to bring it all the way to fruition through building a company. But you are the author of this technology. It's your baby. Which way do you want to do? Which way do you want to bring it? To what is the goal? Why is the technologist doing this? Is there passion? Is there ten tenacity? Is there purpose? Is there a goal? That's the one area that I save for last because by the time we work on commercializing your new technology, 
I don't know if you have the stick to itiveness to make this happen. That's what good consultants do at the SBDC. We work with you, we find answers, and especially for technologists because it's so involved. We use a lot of tools. We have business plan templates. We have financial forecast templates. We have multiple industry research databases that we use. Business operating uh, operations training and assistance videos. We have a lot of webinars that we uh, that we put together for the success of our entrepreneurs. And there's free consulting. Some of the centers even have grad assistance for the research projects. What's the purpose of the Center of Excellence? to assist the technologist to think and operate like an entrepreneur. We do this by asking a lot of the tough questions. Questions like, will this incredible idea make the world a better place or at least a more fun place to live? Is it viable? Is bringing this to market worth the hours of labor, missing family events, placing your financial status at risk and losing hours and hours of sleep. Is the journey worth it? Spoiler alert. If the answer to the previous slide is yes, then let your SBDC help you walk the journey. There's nothing like it. When you see your technology, your invention, your baby out there. Take it from me, been there, done that. It is a riot. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to just very briefly touch on this. And I hope I've intrigued you enough that you will come to the SBDC and ask us for help. We're there to help. We'd love to do it. Aloha, I'm Cynthia Yamasaki, and I'm the Oahu Center Director for the Small Business Development Center located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm so pleased to be with you today, and I'm just going to share with you a high-level overview about America's Small Business Development Centers, some information about who we are, what we do, and how you can get engaged with us. So the Hawaii Small Business Development Center, we have locations on each island of Hawaii, and we are part of America's Small Business Development Network. It's comprised of over a thousand small business development centers like ourselves. And we are really in Hawaii, really driven to help the economy and sustainability, sustainability of Hawaii by assisting small businesses to form, grow and thrive. And like many of the other centers across the nation, we are in partnership. We are created by the University of Hawaii in Hilo and we have received funding from the SBA. So we are resource partners that is funded by the local government as well as the SBA national federal funds. And we provide low cost training and free one-on-one -on -one advisory services to small businesses to help them grow and thrive. So what does that do? What does that mean? So we offer classes and training, but more so the value that you receive when you're working with a small business development advisor is going through what are your challenges? And many, what we find of all the clients that we work with, there's four key areas. When you're first starting out, how is your business concept? And then the key areas of customer relationships and how to be profitable and establishing a really strong organization. And as we look at and develop the relationship with you, whether you're just starting off or like many of you in the audience, looking to get more funding for your research and developing and growing bigger, we can help you in all areas. We provide business advice to help you make decisions and take action. Here are some examples of what we do with our clients, from business planning to risk management, from the starting, up with a great concept to testing it and the really key thing of how you're going to finance it. So many times 
our clients who are looking at SBIRs and STTRs, they want to get some assistance for financing. So we work with other agencies and partners in the community. And as you're growing and starting off your invention and taking it to re more research and development before you go to product, there's different phases. So we work with you in looking at where you are in your phase of your business, whether you're just starting up and advising you, helping to put together, make sure that you have all your financial statements in order, what kind of financing you would need and the matching of funds. So as you're starting off, whether it's your own funds, um, your own personal credit, or getting some angel investors and growing. And as your, as your venture grows to the point of, are you ready to get SBIR, STTR grants and, um, and so forth. So to take your ideas and concepts from invention to market and with all the support that you need for research and development whether you're getting funding from the Department of Defense or Department of Energy or all the different agencies within the federal government, we are in partnership with you to help you give that professional business advice. So I'd like to just share with you someone or a company that we had in Hawaii as a, as a success story to put it all together. So Nala Scientific is located in Honolulu and it, he, um, started the company in 2016. And, in, and as he's got his ideas and concepts, and it's uh, more on his scientific research, he found that he needed more grant funding to take his concept to market. So he worked with this agency within Hawaii called the, the Hawaii Te Technical Development Center. And he came to the Hawaii Small Business Development Center. And together we looked at his finances. We gave him an understanding of what an SBIR is, how it can help him, and then met with the bank so that the banker, local banker here, could understand the concept. So in, in helping him look at his financials, preparing the packages and information that a banker needs, he was able to get his funding to take it. So now he's doing very well and he's not alone. So you might have the scientific knowledge and the and all the technical detail, but you have uh, partnerships of resources within the community to help you to grow and to thrive. And I'm just happy to share that Nalu Scientific is thriving still. And he even came to us when he needed help to keep his employees on board with the SBA PPP funds or the idle loans. These are terms that probably sound foreign or may sound familiar to you. But as a SBA resource partner, all of the America's Small Business Development Centers, we are a network of affiliated um, centers, can assist you in understanding what is it, how it works, and how can you benefit from it. So I encourage you and I invite you to check it out. There are, again, as I said, in every state, even Alaska, uh, down in uh, Guam and um, American Samoa, a whole network of small business development centers. And together we are accredited under the America's Small Business Development Center. What I'm showing to you is a website. If you would like to get more information, I invite you to go to americassbdc.org, click on, um, finding your SBDC in your state, and then you'll see and select it and you'll see other resources. So aloha from Hawaii. I hope you have a great time doing this webinar and conference. Learn, grow, thrive, and contact us for more support. Thank you. And welcome back. So a couple of reminders here for a moment before we get into the next video. Between 2019 and 2021, 370 new businesses uh, were developed, uh, created, and took care of DOD problems. So you can find out more about us in general uh, and about the DES and collaborate by going to the DES community link at the top of your page. The name of that 
overall website is called Unum, U-N-U-M, like in E Pluribus Unum. Next up, we have uh, the Crane Tech Transfer Division, uh, Annie Bullock from the Naval Surface Warfare Center in Crane, Indiana is speaking. All right, thank you all so much for the invitation to join you today. My name is Annie Bullock Yoder, and I'm a member of the Technology Transfer Office at Naval Surface Warfare Center Crane Division. We're located in Southern Indiana on 100 square miles, which makes us the third largest install Navy installation in the world. Uh, we focus on supporting the warfighter and delivering products to their hands uh, in a very rapidly changing technical environment. We have three different focus areas. Those include uh, electronic warfare, strategic missions, and expeditionary warfare. We are one of Indiana's largest high-tech employers with over 3,800 employees, of which over 2,500 are scientists, engineers, and technicians. Uh, we have been engaged with the National Security Innovation Network since 2020, and this has been a really fantastic partnership for us and for NSEN. Uh, we have had the opportunity to work with over half of the programs in their portfolio that they offer, and including some new initiatives that we're just getting ready to ramp up. Uh, those include some crane employees that will become embedded within universities locally uh, to serve as a Crane, Ensign, and University Liaison. We currently have one person uh, with the Indiana University, and we will soon be getting another person that will become embedded within the Purdue University uh, community. So those are fantastic new initiatives that we're working with Ensign to do. Uh, but we've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different programs that, that Ensign works uh, to do. Some of those are in the STEM field, some of those are in research and development, and some of those are in the, the technology transfer for accelerator uh, realm. Uh, the programs that we've specifically worked with include uh, the, the Instant Experts, Hirathon, Tech Squad, X-Force Fellowship Program, Capstone, Hacking for Defense, Maker, Foundry, and Propel. So we've taken advantage of the lo a lot of the different opportunities that, that Instant offers. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few a few different programs that we've taken advantage of over the last three years and some of the successes that have come out of uh, the engagement between Ensign and NSWC Crane. Uh, for one, uh, we have worked extensively with the X-Force Fellowship Program. This is a funded summer internship program for U.S. students. Um, they, they pair students directly with a DOD problem uh, holder, so folks within the DOD that, that need a solution to a specific problem. And the students spend their summers working on these projects directly with uh, the DOD problem holders. Um, in FY20, we had four projects with 14 interns that expanded to 11 projects in FY21. And currently this year, this summer, uh, FY22, we have 16 interns working uh, with uh, our crane scientists, engineers, and technicians on um, different projects. Uh, that, and those interns uh, come from 16 different universities. So we have a lot of participation with different universities, a lot of participation with students. And in addition, um, most of our participation between the students and the problems holders have uh, been virtual, but this year actually the students have the opportunity to come to Crane and to present and do a um, uh, demonstration of the prototypes that they've been working on all summer. And actually that event was held on August 4th and was very well participated uh, and, and very well uh, attended by our leadership and our technical workforce here at NSWC Crane. Um, some of the successes from this have not uh, just been the, the solutions to the prototypes themselves, but also the opportunities that come afterwards. We've had many students that have gone on to SSEP internships later on, as well as accepting smart scholarships so they continue to be involved with DOD problems and solving uh, DOD uh, prototypes and solutions. Um, in addition, uh, one of our uh, X-Force problems that we fed into the program uh, got shared with uh, the X-Force Capstone Collaboration Project. And this is actually something I wanted to 
touch on because the problem was from our corporate communications team. It wasn't from one of our technical uh, engineering uh, teams. So I wanted to highlight that it is possible to continue uh, not just with um, uh, technical problems, but also uh, for corporate and administrative needs as well. Um, Another program that I really wanted to focus on is our engagement that we've had with uh, the Ensign Foundry. And this is something that as part of the Technology Transfer Office, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, extensively over the past three summers. Uh, so the Ensign Foundry program seeks to pair federally developed uh, technologies, uh, patented inventions directly with entrepreneurs from all across the country. Uh, they form teams uh, based on their interests and their expertise. And then these teams work through a program that lasts about four months during the summer uh, to do market exploration, uh, to come up with customer discovery, to do interviews of potential customers, um, and establish plans uh, to form their companies and transition the technology from the DoD lab into the marketplace. Uh, and something that's really unique about the Ensign Foundry program is not just that they're transferring uh, federally developed technologies into the commercial market, but also that they're really focused on dual use applications. So. Um, moving those technologies, not just to a commercial market, but also uh, to an application where they could potentially uh, give back those technologies to the DOD in a better, a better format, more ruggedized, more able to um, meet the warfighter needs. Um, like I said, it's, an, it's a pretty extensive program. They work directly with the scientists and engineers who have invented the technologies here within the lab uh, to come up with a um, transition path and a transition plan to move those technologies from here, from the, fed, from the lab to the commercial market and to the, to the dual use market. Um, in FY20, which was the first summer that we participated with them, uh, we actually fed in and had eight different teams working on NSWC crane technology. Uh, from this, we had um, one licensee, uh, Foresight, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but from FY21, we had two patent licenses and moved two different technologies out of uh, the lab and into the marketplace. Uh, those companies are Simmering and Kupros. And then in FY22, so currently there is an ongoing uh, foundry cohort, and we're currently working with a company right now to establish both a cooperative research and development agreement as well as a patent license. Um, so I said I was going to mention Foresight and talk a little bit about uh, the efforts that we've done with them. Um, Foresight is really uh, a really promising uh, model that's come out of the FY20 cohort. Um, Foresight, the entrepreneurs that uh, that incorporated the company Foresight uh, worked directly with Dr. Corey Berksrud and Alex Zellner uh, during the summer of 2020 on their wireless power technology um, to envision how this might be transfer transferred into the commercial market as well as into a format uh, that would be an improved product to the for the warfighters. Um, we currently have a cooperative research and development agreement with uh, the, the entrepreneurs that incorporated Foresight. They continue to work with our scientists and engineers uh, for a better product, um, as well as a partially exclusive license for the technology. Uh, Foresight has been able to secure outside funding uh, from partners and that is necessary to integrate the technology technology into a product that will be available to both the DOD and to commercial customers. Um, and I believe that uh, Foresight is actually coming to uh, Indiana in a few months to do a demonstration of their new improved technology. So this has been a really amazing success uh, and something that's happened over the last couple of years that I'm really excited that has come directly out of working with Ensign uh, and the programs that they offer. Um, it is really important that uh, as one of the largest high-tech employers here in Southern Indiana, um, as well as uh, a laboratory that supports and develops products for the warfighter, that we continue to be able to access uh, research and development that's done outside of our laboratory, uh, specifically universities and academics. It's important that we find and recruit uh, talent that are in the STEM fields that's coming out, you know, undergraduate, graduate level students that are, are looking for jobs. And it's also important that we are able to transfer federally developed technologies uh, in, or, in order to bolster our economy. Uh, so Ensign has been a really fantastic partnership for us uh, here at Crane. It's been a really fantastic opportunity 
opportunity for our scientists and engineers to work with uh, students, both in the undergraduate and graduate levels, as well as to um, feed problems into those different programs that Ensign offers. Uh, and I really look forward to continuing to work with Ensign in the future um, as we take advantage of more of the programs that they offer and also with new initiatives that we come up with uh, together. Next up is Scott Henderson, Managing Director of Generator and Emotion in Lincoln, Nebraska. And in fact, uh, this is an accelerator uh, business accelerator that is expanding into Omaha here. Uh, so to discuss that is Scott. Hello, my name is Scott Henderson. I'm the managing principal of Motion, powered by Generator. We are the premier startup accelerator in the state of Nebraska. I'm excited to, to visit with you today because um, not only about Motion, but also our, our relationship with Generator and how it might be able to help you in the work that you're doing. So Enmotion and Generator started as independent organizations about the same time, about 10 years ago and nine years ago. Generator 10 years ago in Madison and Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, Enmotion uh, in about nine years ago in Lincoln, Nebraska, both with the same, uh, the, the same focus, which was helping startups grow and accelerate in the cities that they were, rather than letting the uh, best and brightest talent leave to go to other places. Um, and really, if you think about this in very simple terms, um, I think startups are, are best described as, as bees. I mean, the bees are the ones that know, know what they're doing. Uh, the founders are, are, are going to be founding companies, whether or not they get help. And the key is, is making sure that these bees, um, you know, are, are at the center of whatever ecosystem, whatever organization, whatever efforts you're doing to help uh, a encourage entrepreneurs in your communities. Uh, and because bees themselves, they're the ones that make the honey. I mean, this, if you want to remember one thing from this thing is bees make the honey and that, uh, you know, we need more honey. And, uh, you know, in order to get that, you need to support the bees and, and feed the bees in the times when there's there's not nectar flowing. And that's, that's kind of where a startup accelerator comes in is, you know, coming in at the right moment to give very concentrated focus and effort and connections and relationships uh, to help the, the founders themselves grow and build the companies so they can create lots of money, which is the metaphor is honey, honey, money, get it? So anyways, the uh, the main thing about uh, Enmotion and uh, Generator working together, um, Enmotion uh, brought uh, the Generator uh, into Nebraska about three years ago to help power the organization that uh, was created in, two, uh, in uh, nine years ago here in Nebraska and, and bring the um, all of the resources, all the knowledge, all of the, the, um, the relationships that come with Generator, which is now operating in 33 communities across seven time zones. Uh, we've helped over 840 startups, um, and all of those startups combined have raised over a billion dollars in additional funding uh, th uh, through the help that we've given them in our startup acceleration programs. And, you know, so we have this national network um, that is growing and doing very well in many communities across the country. Um, and, you know, uh, married together with a local uh, root structure in Nebraska, which is getting stronger and stronger. For about the last 15 years, there's been a very intentional effort in the state of Nebraska to help high growth startups. And just last year alone, we saw the highest ever total of dollars invested into Nebraska startups, over a quarter billion dollars in one year alone. Now, that's awesome, but just last week it was announced that one company uh, has just raised $300 million by themselves, for themselves, this year in 2022. So not only did we set the record last year, but we already have a record setting this year. So what is Startup Acceleration? I think the best thing, the best way to describe it is through the, the companies that have come through. Uh, and uh, notable, most notable within the Motion history is Quantified Ag, which came out of the very first cohort. Um, and Vishal Singh here was a uh, was at the University of Nebraska and had some thoughts and ideas. And he brought his idea into a program, the Enmotion Startup Acceleration Program, uh, that really helped him focus on what the problem was. And was there enough problem, enough people having that problem? And then in the idea of uh, development and uh, what the customer wants, what's the solution? And from that came the idea of quantified ag, which is basically Fitbit for cattle, putting uh, ear tags in cattle to help them measure their health. And it was, a, it was our best exit, uh, to, uh, exit so far. <clears throat> the purchase price actually is undisclosed amount, but I can tell you that our second largest was $9 million. So this one's bigger. And uh, uh, more, more importantly, it was uh, purchased by Merck Animal Health 
which is a really great story for the state of Nebraska and for in motion, but more importantly, for the startup founder Vishal and his team who uh, got to reap the, the windfall of selling a, a company that was just a mere idea and helping accelerate it, building it out, and then getting to the size where a large company like Merck Animal Health Science would want to purchase it from. So it, this, this idea of getting very specific strategic information and focus at the right moment is a lot of what startup acceleration is. Another notable uh, alumni of the InMotion program uh, is Canary Sound Design, which basically has just uh, created a sound system for the surgical ward that will turn off when there's a, uh, an emergency alarm going off on any of the machinery that's in there. Bird's Eye Robotics, uh, Bird's Eye Technologies, they're focused on uh, chicken producers and helping make sure that they're, they're scooping up the dead chickens and monitoring and sweeping up uh, the, uh, the chicken uh, houses that, that you know most of you eat your chicken you know, buy your chicken from Corral Technologies. Another good example of Nebraska technology is is basically uh, remote control cattle, uh, uh, dog collars, but for cows. Um, another example of Nebraska innovation is Snappy Workflow, uh, which is using thermographic imaging uh, to scan electric utility lines uh, across the state and across the country uh, and to make sure that they don't fail uh, before a, a wildfire starts or power outage comes out of. So. Um, you know, another example is Bumper, which is a uh, fintech uh, innovation around Gen Z teenagers uh, and, and helping Gen Z teenagers invest directly in the companies with the peace of mind that the parents could have knowing that they're doing wisely. And then another example of uh, you know, companies that have come through this program is WellCapped, which is high-end wig rental. Think Rent the Runway, but for high-end wigs. Um, you know, it's uh, interesting to see that wigs are six hundred hundred dollars per wig, and uh, now, now instead of buying it, you can rent it. Um, so these are these are ideas that have come out of a startup acceleration program here and in motion um, from start uh, to finish. And you know, everything we do is about relationships. When I describe a startup accelerator. Um, every startup accelerator really is a network of people, a network of uh, mentors, a network of founders. It's a ne network of investors. It's a network of community champions who are wanting to help these companies grow where they are, helping them grow in place. And um, I think John Maida, who was at the time president at the Rhode Island School of Design, went on to be the first designer for uh, Andrea Dreesen Horowitz and then was at um, the company that uh, runs WordPress. His statement, I thought, really struck deeply with me. So the idea that we get so caught up in technology that we forget it's the people that make the technology and it's the relationships that make the bigger stuff possible. And so when we focus on relationships and we focus on people first and right, that everything else will follow. And I think that's the best way to describe what a Startup Accelerator program is all about. And then to illustrate this, the, the difference that we make is we're helping create um, a significant amount of new connections and then deepening existing connections for the startup uh, founders who come through our programs. And you think about the company on the left versus the company on the right, which one you th do you think is going to be able to create its own luck? Because the more connections that you have, the more people that you're talking to, the more investors that you're engaging, the more customers that you're engaging, the more mentors and um, uh, fellow founders that you're engaging, you're going to open up doors that you didn't know were, were even existent. And, uh, and I think that's you know, between the relationships and between making deeper connections and wider connections, that's really helps illustrate the impact that a startup accelerator brings. And I think to summarize this all up, it's density is destiny. It's this density of shared experiences that really leads to the serendipity that, you, that you'll that you experience as a, as a startup. And that serendipity gives you more chances to collaborate and build trust with other people. And it's, it's really down to the trusted relationships on which every strong innovative community as well as every strong innovative company is built upon. So if you want to change your density, change your destiny. And so going back to Nmotion and Generator, um, what made this uh, uh, collaboration possible three years ago is that both organizations were focused on the same mission, which is to be the best partner for our community so that we can invest in its best and brightest. We've been doing that here in Nebraska for nine years, and we've been doing this across the country for 10 years. And so everywhere we go, we're helping the local organizations and local companies and local investors and let local founders really make sure that they have the best shot possible to create great companies in their hometown. And what's exciting for us here in Nebraska with Nmotion is in the past year, we've been able to uh, bring, bring together two great startup communities, Lincoln and Omaha, and help build connections out into the rest of the state of Nebraska by 
by engaging a, a wider uh, circle of investors who have collectively invested $3.7 million to expand and motion into a statewide organization with offices in Lincoln and Omaha and programs that will benefit founders across the state. And how we do that is in two ways. Uh, if you look at this, this image, it, it really helps describe the different ways that you know, you know, what programs are out there to help support early stage high growth companies. Um, we operate the Enmotion Venture Studio, which is considered a startup studio. And then we also uh, operate the Enmotion Growth Accelerator, which is uh, a traditional accelerator. And the difference between, between the two is that the studio is where we're focused on founders before they actually have their idea, before they have it baked. You know, they ha might have a desire to create something, but they haven't really formed everything and calcified it around that problem. As opposed to an accelerator, the growth accelerator, we are looking for existing companies and teams and people with customers, people that have already decided which cake they're going to bake. Um, and so in the studio, we're coming up with mad ideas for whole new recipes and whole new concepts of what that could look like. But in the accelerator, we are looking at an existing company that's already uh, already made a mark and already starting to hit a point where they're, they're finding product market fit and just need a little, a little bit more resources, a little more energy, a little more, a little more uh, connections and introductions to help hit that inflection point. And so the Enmotion Venture Studio is opening is open right now for applications. It's a, it's a program that will run from October until February. So October 2022 to February 2023. Um, deadline is early deadline. Early admission deadline is August 22nd. Final deadline is September 5th. And we're looking for people, individual founders, pair of founders, team of founders, folks that really want to bring their expertise, their domain experience, um, their talents and skills to help us uh, kind of collaboratively come up with some sort of category of creating concept that they can go and build and scale with us and with our help. And we'll work shoulder to shoulder for four months straight and then provide support over the, the coming years for whatever they need from us uh, as we get them in front of customers and we help them book their first revenue and then help them raise their next round of funding. Examples, as I mentioned, Snappy Workflow came out of this, thermographic imaging, Bitverify is looking at crypto assets and making sure that you have what you say you have. Uh, uh, dog health scouts helping tie behavioral um, indicators of dog uh, uh, health with uh, actual health diagnoses. Ensemble is uh, focused on helping digital artists create um, new ways, new income streams using their creative art artifacts, uh, kind of like uh, Disney selling off signed animation cells. They do that with digital artists. And then SheMates helping raise the, uh, women's sports by connecting and elevating uh, women athletes um, to, to aspiring uh, college students, I mean, high school students who want to connect with college and professional women athletes. So it's exciting kind of programs that come out of this. Uh, we're agnostic to which industry, uh, but it's it's fun fun to see what, what happens when you really focus on a founder, what makes them tick and what ideas they have. Now, and Motion Growth Accelerator is a new program that we just uh, debuted here in July uh, and announced a new cohort. It's going to run from July to October, 12-week program with existing companies. Um, we've got six great companies, uh, th uh, three of them are Nebraska-based, one Iowa-based, and two Missouri-based, all which are establishing a Nebraska presence uh, through our programming. Uh, and like the Motion Venture Studio, where we invest $100,000 into each of the new companies, uh, we're also investing $100,000 in each of these companies. So collectively, we're investing $1.2 million over two programs, and uh, over the next two years, directly investing $2.4 million into uh, 24 companies that, uh, through the two programs that we're on. So Hellcat Technology is doing some great things, helping the telecom industry industry and construction industry, Microsoft, Microwash, excuse me, is helping uh, come up with a new way to do COVID testing without the uh, poking your nose. Particle Space is doing no-code tools for commercial real estate. Her headquarters is helping women-led businesses uh, connect and collaborate with each other uh, as they grow each other's businesses through marketing collaborations. NovaQ is a learning management system for manufacturers, and Tiga is a really great uh, uh, hydration drink that has come out of the University of Nebraska uh, community. So if you are interested in learning more about any of those programs, or maybe you know somebody who should apply for the Motion Venture Studio, applications are open, as I said, uh, until September 5th. We'd love to meet someone, uh, someone who wants to really take a big swing and invest in themselves. We have $100,000 that we'll, uh, we'll put into a company and build with them. Uh, or if you want to know how your company might uh, be able to be part of a 
future in motion growth accelerator. We'll have another cohort of each uh, program next year. Uh, please email me at scott at generator.com uh, and uh, we'd love to talk with you or go to inmotion.co to learn more all about what we're doing. So thanks for your time. Excited to have uh, the ability to return uh, and always great to, to know that other people are out there in the community trying to help support entrepreneurs. So if you, um, I will say this, if you do want to help mentor, uh, we are always looking for great mentors and we set up two hour sessions called Mentor Swarms uh, where uh, you would meet each of the six companies coming through our programs in just a two hour window via Zoom on a speed mentoring basis and see how you can help them in 15 minutes. So there's always a way to help. There's always a way to support. So please let me know that you're out there and you want to help and support. Uh, email me at scott at generator.com. Uh, and uh, definitely, if you know somebody who wants uh, that needs to apply for our programs, we'd love for them to be a part of an upcoming in motion cohort. So thank you again and uh, look forward to uh, seeing all the other presentations and, and hope that uh, you learned a little bit about what we're doing. So if you want to go back to it, it's just bees make the honey. So support those bees. Thank you. Coming up next is Frank Hopper, the Managing Director of Capital Innovators. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Frank Hopper. I am the Managing Director at Capital Innovators, and I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about what we've been working on at Capital Innovators and um, how we can work with you. I also want to introduce Brett Lewing, our Program Director um, at, here at Capital Innovators. He oversees all of our accelerator programs. He's going to be speaking um, in a few slides. So first, um, just a little bit of history on Capital Innovators. Uh, we've been around for a little bit over a decade now. We uh, opened our doors in 2011 um, with our own flagship accelerator. Um, since then, we have invested in um, over 170 companies um, in a wide variety of industries. Uh, we've put on uh, accelerators that operate out of our own venture funds, as well as um, accelerators on behalf of corporations. And that's a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. We've done an accelerator um, for Ameren, and then most recently, we um, operate a accelerator on the behalf of NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, and we'll share a little bit more about that in a few slides. But whenever you look at our whole portfolio, um, we're really happy with how it's performing. We have um, over 77% of our companies are still operating. Those companies have gone on to raise, um, after going through our program, they've gone on to raise over $490 million, which is a stat that we're really, proud of, really proud of. Um, they've also um, generated a lot of jobs. So uh, whenever you look at all of our portfolio companies, they... Uh, it includes over 2,100 jobs, which is uh, pretty incredible for a portfolio of our size um, located here in St. Louis. So um, what we mainly want to talk about today is uh, our kind of two, how we engage with the defense sector, kind of what everybody's here to learn a little bit more about. So we have our industry-specific accelerator program that we do through NGA. Um, I'll share a little bit more about that in the next slide, but we also make investments um, directly out of our own venture funds, and we have our own accelerator program. Um, so through our funds, we're industry and vertical agnostic. However, um, unlike a lot of other venture funds, we are open um, to companies that work in the defense sector, um, particularly dual use companies. We've made a couple investments into the space already, um, mainly um, by way of the NGA accelerator, but we've also put some other dual use companies that aren't a fit for that program through our own accelerator as well. Um, so we're really open to working in this space and plan on continuing to stay uh, very involved in the space from our own venture perspective, as well as with the NGA Accelerator. So a little bit more about the NGA Accelerator. Uh, we've just completed our third cohort last month, um, something that we're really excited about. We wrapped it up um, at the end of July. Um, the Accelerator itself is a partnership between three groups. Um, the Missouri Technology Corporation holds a partnership intermediary agreement, um, a PIA, with NGA um, and through that, they're able to put on uh, contract capital innovators to put on the NGA accelerator. And uh, Brett's going to tell you a little bit more on the specifics of the accelerator and, and what happens during the 12 weeks of the program. Um, but here, I want to make sure and call out um, a number of our partners that we've worked with that helped to make the accelerator such a success. So Ensign, of course, is one. Um, they have been really helpful in connecting um, our companies in with other government clients outside of within and outside of NGA. Um, they've also been great resources to us as we've continu continued to grow the ecosystem. 
that the NGA accelerator is, is built around. Um, excellent, excellent partners. Um, then also T-Rex. T-Rex uh, is a co-working space here in St. Louis that houses uh, Moonshot Labs, which is NGA's public space where the accelerator uh, operates out of. And then I want to give a head nod to uh, the Taylor Geospatial Institute, a new uh, geospatial institute that's a partnership between a number of universities here um, in the in the Midwest, um, and then as well as Cortex, CIC, and Artrans are all excellent partners for us and our companies uh, as they've gone through the program. Go ahead, hand things over to Brett to we'll kind of walk through the accelerator program. Awesome, thanks, Frank. Hey, everyone. Uh, really quickly to walk through the uh, overview of the NGA Accelerator. Um, so like Frank said, we have just completed our third cohort. Um, the first cohort itself kicked off in, in 2021. Um, so really quick, uh, the program outline, it's a 12-week program. Um, we select eight companies for each cohort um, and provide them with significant grant funding. Um, we match each company with a lead mentor. Uh, these lead mentors are either industry uh, veterans um, or retired or semi-retired C-suite executives um, that kind of focus on more of the commercial um, side with these companies. Um, and on the flip side, each company is also matched with an NGA champion team. Um, these NGA champions are people that work within internal to NGA. Um, it's an opportunity, kind of an extended uh, period of uh, customer discovery for these companies. So the objective of the program is to uh, bring them here to St. Louis, expose them to the ecosystem and growing uh, geospatial support. Um, but also give them an opportunity to learn about how they can tailor their product um, and uh, their companies uh, to, to cater to NGA in the broader DOD uh, space. So um, great opportunity for these companies. Uh, typical programming. Uh, so like I said, uh, it's kind of a hybrid model um, where these companies are coming to St. Louis for a few weeks, um, but are also virtual for, for some of these weeks. Um, and they engage with their champion teams, their lead mentors, um, and then also kind of foundational workshops throughout the, uh, the 12 weeks. Next slide, please. This slide just quickly outlines. Uh, so at this point, we've gone, uh, we have 24 companies uh, as alumni to the Accelerator. Um, as I mentioned, each cohort focuses specifically on uh, specific problem statements. Um, so we work with different directorates within NGA um, to kind of target companies and select companies um, for that cohort. Um, some quick stats, uh, now that cohort one uh, completed just a, over a year ago, um, we have some pretty cool stats. Um, in cohort one, um, in the last two quarters, so in 2022, uh, these companies have collectively raised over 12 million in venture funding. Um, three of these companies are on track for over a million in revenue uh, in 2022. Uh, one of them actually is on track for over 5 million in revenue. Um, Another great kind of impact stat, um, these companies in cohort one have hired uh, in the last year since completing the program, they've hired over 44 new full-time employees um, and 18 part-time employees. Um, and then of course, the big question of, of government contracting, three of these companies in the last two quarters have also, um, have also gone on for government contracts, uh, to win government contracts. Uh, looking at the broader picture of all three cohorts, um, just about seven companies, um, potentially more in the future, um, are involved day-to-day -day in the St. Louis ecosystem. So that's a, a huge win as, as uh, more partners uh, come out to the Midwest and uh, support NGA's mission and, and the broader geospatial uh, startup culture. I'll be frank. Awesome. Thanks, Brett. Um, finally, I want to wrap up by kind of, by outlining in a little bit more detail how capital innovators invest, how the like what your opportunity and what your opportunities are to work with capital innovators. So um, first, we have our pre-seed and seed stage accelerator program. Um, so that program, we're looking for companies that have a product of some kind that is mostly complete and that um, they're able to sell um, before coming into the program or while in the program. Um, there is some flexibility there. Uh, but for the most part, that's that's kind of our, our initial judgment of what we're looking for. Again, the accelerator is a vertical and industry agnostic, so we're open to all kinds of different things. Um, that said, uh, we ha are more and more interested in the, the defense, defense and national security dual use space. Um, so we encourage everyone to stay tuned and apply uh, to the accelerator program. We'll also uh, continue with the NGA accelerator program as that continues to keep an eye open for applications there. Um, so, so stay tuned for that. And then 
We also do Series A investments. So those Series A investments, we're looking for companies that have a million in the trailing 12 months in commercial revenue or have established um, past a contract uh, with defined end users. Um, so for that as well, um, that is, that's not an application process. That's more of a standard venture pitching process. So reach out to us. Um, our contact information is, is available uh, through this presentation. Uh, we'll wrap up on the next slide with, with another email address for everybody. But um, those are our two main ways that we make investments. Um, so we encourage everybody to, to stay tuned uh, for the accelerator programs, if that's an option for you, um, as well as the Series A as well. And that wraps us up with Capital Innovators. Thank you all so much for joining us and for listening in. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope to meet um, as many of you as possible. If you have any questions about anything, you can reach out to Brett or I um, or send uh, send your, your deck to us. We're happy to review um, and keep everybody posted on next steps with our accelerator programs. Thank you. Coming up next is the SBIR presentation or Small Business Innovative Research uh, presentation. Now, this is a big deal. Now, the DOD CIBR uh, funding is not yet uh, secured for fiscal year 23 coming up. I want to make everybody uh, aware of that. Um, the presenter, Ed Lehew, from the Small Business Development Center at the uh, University of Missouri Extension will go over that during his presentation. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, Remember, please, that slides will be available at the DES community website called Unum. You will have to register if you haven't been on that site before. That's no big deal. It's a painless process. Um, the Sibbers people will be holding or conducting a live question and answer period after the main presentations at the DES here are given. Uh, and uh, that session will end, the booth sessions will end at 5 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Central. Now, on to this Sibbers presentation. Hi, my name is Ed Lehu. I'm the Innovation and Technology Counselor with the Missouri Small Business Development Center. Thanks for joining us on the intro to SBIR and STTR here at the symposium. And I'm presenting this not only on behalf of Missouri SBDC, but also for, with Josh Nicole Caddy, who's with the Nebraska Business Development Center, Please join Josh and I for a Q&A session at the Expo booth later today. So let's jump right in. So what is SBIR and STTR? Well, the short answer is it's a $4.282 billion federal funding program mandated by legislation in 1982. And the purpose is to increase and support scientific excellence and technology uh, innovation through investment through federal research funds. So the SBIR is the Small Business Innovation Research, and its kissing cousin is STTR, Small Business Technology Transfer. And I'll talk a little bit later on what the differences are, but the, the idea of the program is really to support small business, to stimulate new technology innovation, and develop products with commercial merit, and hopefully also social good, and to ultimately create jobs. So it's really a mechanism to fund, you know, kind of best early stage, high risk innovation, uh, innovative ideas, ideas really that are too high risk for private sector. So as you can see in this chart, it's really trying to fit that, that wedge in between basic science where a lot of government funding goes uh, as well, versus uh, the far end is the commercialization where you're getting private funding. So this is really designed just prior to angel investors because you don't have a prototype yet. So you don't have uh, anything to really go out and get pitch, pitch investment. So the government really is, think of them as your angel investor investing in your startup. So here's some startups examples that actually got SBIR funding. Uh, you probably recognize many of these. I have included a link. You can go and learn more about all these companies. Uh, so what is the main difference between SBIR and STTR? Well, the short answer is SBIR permits partnering where STTR requires it. And it requires you to partner with a nonprofit research institution, such as a university or, or a federal research lab. Um, under the SBIR, the principal investigator has to be employed more than 50% with the small business. So for instance, if you're a professor or academia, you would have to take a sabbatical to the SBIR, but you could do the SDTR as an employed, employed by the university. 
in that scenario. So the PI on the SDTR would be employed by either the research institution uh, or the small business, but it really varies by, you know, by uh, agency you needs to check that solicitation. So on the SBIR side, you can subcontract up to 33% on a phase one and up to 50% on a phase two, where on the SDTR, you actually have minimums. So 40% of it has to be with a small business and at least 30% has to be with the research institution partner. Um, the more, the most of the funds are actually in the SBIR, about 3.25% of all the agency's funding, where the SDTR is about roughly about a half percent. Um, but what we find is there's less people applying on the SDTR side. So don't let that scare you uh, if you're considering partnering. And many startups need to partner with these federal agencies or there's or these uh, research institutions at a university because they don't necessarily have the expertise. Um, so that's the reason why the STTR was created. Not all the agencies do STTRs. Uh, some do both and some do only SBIR. So here's a simple chart, uh, and this is actually getting ready to change. The USDA uh, coming late this year, early next year, will actually offer both SBIR, STTR. But right now, all the ones in blue are only SBIR only. The green offer both SBIR and STTR. So here's a good map of a uh, good chart showing you the budgets by agency. And you can see DOD, a lot of folks are interested in that today at our symposium, um, is, a, is about almost half, half of the, uh, the funding. Now, most of the DOD and NASA are what we call contracts because of the way that the contracting laws with purchasing, because ultimately they're interested in actually purchasing the product from you once the product gets developed, where the other agencies are grants because they're not gonna actually purchase from you. They're just, they're, think of them as your angel investor who's given you non-dilutive capital. Um, and uh, where the the, uh, the DOD and some of the contract things are actually in the process of ultimately trying to buy this from you. Uh, there's really three phases to the SBI or STTR. Um, though phase, phase one and phase two are really where the funding is happening. Phase three is really what we just call commercialization, where there's really no funding uh, other than you may get a contract with DOD or other NASA or other contracting agencies. But in phase one, it's really about concept development. So you're trying to prove, uh, get over a technical hurdle and prove why this, this concept makes sense. Um, and that's typically six months to a year. Uh, it could be as small as $50,000 with something like AppWorks, all the way up to NSF, uh, up to $275,000. So you can see it's quite a bit of, quite a bit of non-dilute capital available. In phase two, now you're trying to actually prove this on a larger scale, typically doing a prototype. This is more like 24 months, anywhere from a half million dollars to and, uh, NIH is the high end, just raised it recently at $1.7 million. And like I said, in phase three is really more about you going out and getting funding uh, from angel investors or early stage uh, investors, or you're doing government government contracting in that phase. So why consider SBIR as TTR? Well, it really fills that gap between new startups uh, with no capital to build prototype and an investable business that has product or revenue. So if you've already got revenue and you're already existing with this product, you're not likely to get an SBIR. So it's really designed for those who, who have no capital, need to build a prototype, but it's highly innovative. Uh, it's non-dilutive capital. As I mentioned earlier, it's the largest source of non-dilutive. So basically it's free money. It's the it's the federal government investing in you as a as almost like I said, like an angel, angel investor, but are taking no uh, no equity in your, in your company. The other cool thing is this award validates technology prior to investment. So the idea is this is de-risking it so that the investment community can look at this and say, hey, this has been proven. Uh, the federal government's already behind this. And that helps you as an investor or as a um, startup to actually go out and get investors later. It enables that uh, prior to investment. Uh, it also, in the, in the university scenario or a federal lab, it enables early transfer technology uh, to startups. And then like I had mentioned it tracks commercialization partners and funding because you've proven this uh, because right now it's, it's an unproven concept. 
Small business retains uh, ownership and in intellectual property. There's a few exceptions. There's a link you can check it out. But basically what it means is the government can't share reports. This is all kept confidential. Um, and, and the data outside the federal government for 20 years. So who qualifies? Well, you must, you must be a small business. So that's under 500 employees for profit, US owned and controlled. At least 50% is to be owned by US citizens or a permanent resident um, located in the US. The other key, key thing is important is the R&D for the grant itself needs to be formed in the United States. We run across this challenge with some software companies, uh, people doing coding all over the world. Uh, that can't be done, it has to be done in the US. Also, the company has to have the controlled research space or an office uh, for the grant project. So it doesn't mean you have to own the space, but you have to have keys to the, to the lab or keys to the office. So it's, you, know, you can lease, lease this uh, um, space, uh, but you have to have access to it. So in other words, you can't do it in your basement if you're a startup trying to trying to do this. Um, and actually the, the, the grant will fund the lease on that. That can be part of your part of your submission. So what's involved with the submission? Well, first of all, the most important thing is it has to be an innovative novel concept that matches a research topic to one of the federal agencies. Now, a little bit later, I'll talk about the National Science Foundation, which is more about, a, it's a uh, uh, investigator initiated, initiated. So this is a very broad topics, um, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. But really what you're trying to do is the federal government is interested in moving science and technology against certain topics. And so your technology needs a match up to those topics. And I'll show you a bit later about how to, how to go search for that. Also a good understanding of the current state and how your technology pushes beyond that current state, particularly understanding what others have tried to do in this space and how you're gonna go beyond that and how that also provides you with some competitive advantage uh, in terms of commercialization. And it has to be a research plan. This is about R&D. Uh, this isn't going to fund your, mar you know, your your big market research study or your, um, you know, sales or buy buy uh, build prototypes. Uh, this is really about the the core research uh, and demonstrates that you can prove prove the concept. Uh, identification of a project team to carry out this. They're going to want you to have people on your team, which is why a lot of people pursue the SDTR now that have actually done research in this field. It doesn't have to be the exact same research, but similar research and, and bring that to the, to the table. Um, a market estimate and good customer segment identified. This is what they call significance and possibly social good. You really got to be able to do customer discovery if you haven't really identified what's the customer's problem, how you're solving that better than current state, uh, and a good estimate of what that market looks like. Because there's going to be reviewers on all these panels that are not going to look at, not just on the technical side, but they will understand that you're also got a market opportunity as well. Even in this case of DOD, in many cases, they want to know that you're going to be able to do what they call dual use. So it's beyond just selling to them. They want you to be able to be able to also have this be a commercial success outside of their contract. So time and effort, about 150 hours over a 10 week period. Uh, for this 15 to 20 page work plan. Uh, and that's generally what we estimate for someone who's never done a grant before. Once you've done a couple of these, you could probably do a little bit quicker. Now you're not gonna be doing the 10, working every day in those 10 weeks. It's 150 hours over that period of time. And I'll show you a little bit more in detail. Some of that is also including just getting some uh, registered in SAM. Um, and then typically it's gonna take you about six months to get the funds after you uh, be awarded from the submission. So what's needed for an SBIR? Well, you already be, you have to be set up as a small business, register with your state, um, an address, you have to have a company bank account. Uh, and essentially how the government does it is they do it through, uh, elect, think of it, your tax returns. Most of us all file electronically, very similar. They're gonna deposit money into, the, into, that, into that electronically. Um, required registration, there's a link here for a tutorial. I always recommend people take about up to six weeks to get this. It may only take a couple of weeks, but I've had a number of people that waited the last minute, get the registration done, and they missed the deadline uh, for their submission. You need an employer identification number. Most likely you already have that if you're already if you've already started your business. 
Um, it used to be you had to go and get a DUNS number. Now that's being replaced by a, a unique identity identifier as part of the SAMS registration. So now you just take your EIN number, go to uh, SAMS.gov, and SAM stands for System for Award Management. It's the same uh, award management system for any kind of government contracting, but also if you're going to go after a grant, it's the same, it's the same system. And then you go to SBR.gov, taking all that information below and then registering with them. And then you may have other specific registrations for your particular agency, uh, grants.gov, research.gov, and then NIH uses was using an ERA Commons. They're in the process of switching to what they, something called ASSIST, uh, but that hasn't fully happened yet. So every agency will have a little bit different way to submit, uh, but you'll be able to do that once you have all the other uh, registration completed. So what are your chances of being rewarded? awarded? Well, on average, about 16% of all phase ones get awarded. 55% uh, of phase twos. So typically what happens is you have a successful phase one, they're anxious for you and will usually welcome you to, to go ahead and pursue a phase two, uh, which is why it's such a high rate on phase two. And you can see these are, I won't go through these in detail, um, uh, but DHS is, is probably the highest. Part of the reason I think is some of these just get less submissions. Uh, as you get down into popular submissions like NSF, uh, is as low as 11%. But that's not a bad rate when you think about only 1% of startups actually get uh, get venture capital. Okay, now I want to talk a little bit about research topics. Um, there's really kind of what we recommend um, is to do a three-step process. And I'll go through these in detail. Step one, though, is first to do a Google search and generate synonyms for your technology or research area. And the reason you're doing this is because every agency may have a different term for the same technology, or there may be other applications that you hadn't even thought about. And then the next step is to search past awards to get a sense of what agencies might fit for you. Typically, the past kind of predicts the future. Um, and you would do that on sbr.gov using those synonyms to determine you know, the best search hits you can get related to your technology, but not too many. So if you search it, you know, you search in something that's a very broad term, it's gonna come up with, you know, several thousand searches. Um, so you wanna try to find, find that balance. And then the third step is to search current research topics then to figure out which ones that you can apply for. So step one, I already mentioned doing the Google search. So here's an example that might help you. A startup has experience working with forensic laboratory for a large metropolitan police department. So they have some ideas regarding more effective way to analyze DNA to glean more information about solving crimes. So if you do a Google search, uh, think about things like DNA, DNA testing, fingerprinting, profiling, uh, typing, forensics, uh, and go, and here's an actual link, and you go into where, you see the circle here where it says search keywords. Um, and this is what happens. I tried different combinations. The other key thing is quotes are important because when you do the quotes, it grabs both of those words together. So I won't go through this in detail, but basically what we find, figure out is when we do DNA testing without the quotes, we get way too many hits because it's picking up each of those words. Um, and then when you add an additional word, and by the way, where it says plus, that's just my way of saying add the word. Don't actually put the plus sign in there. I always have to remind people that. Some people see that and think, oh, do I have to have the plus? And, but then when you start getting to some of these things like uh, testing or profiling, you get into other things like health screening that may not really apply to your technology. Um, so in the end, what, I figured, what we figured out from this example is DNA profiling in quotes and the word forensic seem to get the most appropriate hits. And it got six hits including uh, NSF, DOD, and Homeland Security. So it was really a great fit. And here's what it actually looks like. It'll actually tell you the company that actually, what they call, they call it a small business concern. That's what SBC stands for. And then it'll tell you the number, the topic number that they that they were awarded on. And it actually, if you click on this, um, this is not a clickable one. This is just a, a picture of this. It'll actually take you in a contact information of the name, uh, email, and I think a phone number of the person. And 
I've had many startups that have actually reached out to these other companies that are doing similar technology and have actually done collaboration with them. So it's a great way to, to you know, find out, you know, obviously you want to be careful what you share. Uh, if you get, you know, if you're really starting to talk with them, you want to get an NDA, but uh, it's a great way to find out who's out there, what has been done in this field. Um, and then this is the other three, um, very similar. So you basically take that, so you look at your past, and now I can say, okay, now I've got a pretty good idea of which agencies uh, or which topics I want to go after. And then you type that into the current um, uh, some of the proposals or current solicitations um, is a general term. Uh, DOD will use the term uh, BAA, uh, broad uh, announcement. Uh, and then keep in mind different agencies will use new topics based on various schedules. So your search might not happen, you know, may not get what you want today, but then if you go back again in a couple of weeks, it may, may give it new things. Uh, but you also get to really, uh, I recommend that most agencies have a uh, email newsletter and you publish, they'll publish topics, but they'll also send out, you know, as soon as item, new items are, are added, they'll send it out to your listserv. So I'd recommend that you do that. But one of the things that you'll find is you actually may figure out that there's another application for your technology that you hadn't even thought about. So that's why it's really important to kind of understand how, uh, what we find is NIH has their own language uh, versus NSF versus DOD. So what they may what they may call one thing uh, over, over another agency, they'll call it something completely different. So it's really good an idea of understanding their language. So that's kind of the summary of this. Learn the agency's language, you know, determine those various synonyms as well as experimenting with different combinations um, to narrow that search results uh, to really kind of figure out what keywords relate to your technology. Um, and then, like I said, you may, you may find other applications for your technology uh, that you have not thought about. So I wanna talk a little bit about National Science Foundation. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, National Science Sounds Foundation really is a rolling. Uh, they generally have four submissions a year. This year, they only had three. Part of it, I think they were kind of getting caught up from all the COVID. Um, but it, it's, it's a great option because um, it's very broad topics. So they have a topic. One example of a topic is artificial intelligence. They really don't care what idea you come forward with. Um, in fact, if you don't fit into one of their categories, they have a category called other. Um, they have not uh, released their schedule for 2023, but as you can see right now, we're in the last cycle uh, that ends October 6th. Uh, they will probably still allow submissions. Uh, my guess is that next timeline will probably be somewhere in January, because that's kind of the cycle that you can see there. Um, you can go to that link there that I've included in the deck, and it'll give you more detail on each of the topics. But the way that NSF works, because it's, remember it's uh, investigator initiated, uh, is that you have to be invited. And how you get invited is you first do a project pitch. And a project pitch is just a brief definition that gets, gets reviewed in about three or four weeks. Uh, and then once you're selected, they, you have up to one year to do a full proposal. What the project pitch looks like is it's 1,500 words, about 500 words on, you know, kind of an overview of your, your concept, your technology, another 500 words um, on, um, the market in terms of commercialization. And then the remainder is your team, uh, team profile, um, and then a little bit of summary about what you're, who you are. And then what one in three project pitches get invited to a full submission. So it's a pretty high hit rate. And then please don't think that just because they invite you to submission or saying that they're gonna approve your proposal. Uh, I always remind people, think about it. If you, if you were a program director and you had several million dollars to allocate, uh, when you want the best concepts, the best ideas. Uh, so you're going to want more submissions. So you can see in the case of NSF, about 15, only about 15% of those full submissions get, uh, get awarded. Uh, so a lot of people think when they get invited, they're thinking, oh, they're really interested in my idea. No, they just, you just simply pass the initial test of, yeah, this is something well fun. Typically what happens is why most NSF uh, project pitches get rejected is because they don't see that as an innovative idea. What they're wanting is they're wanting something truly breakthrough. Um, I'm located in St. Louis, Missouri. 
And as you probably know, the Mississippi River, we got like five bridges across there. So if you told me, you know, hey, I've got a new way to build a bridge across the Mississippi River, you'd be kind of going, hmm, yeah, it's, it's, it's really more of an engineering challenge. It's not a new science. It's not new technology. But if I told you I was going to build a bridge from uh, California to Hawaii, all of a sudden that involves new technology. It's new science. Uh, they're very much that interested. Another example, NSF says, if you came to us and said, I got I to gotta go away, away to go to the moon, uh, they'd say, eh, it's already been done. You know, but if you, go, if you can help us get to Mars, uh, you know, let's talk. So it really has to be breakthrough. Um, we run into this problem in the IT space with software, uh, algorithms, things like that. Uh, you know, you got a fanciful code. Yeah, you might think it's really innovative and unique, might be innovative in the marketplace, but it really has to be both innovative in the marketplace as well as breakthrough in terms of new thinking, new science uh, beyond current state. So it's not just um, evolution, it has to be revolution, it has to be really a, a step a step beyond the current state. So for the agencies that are outside of NSF, typically what we do is we recommend that you put together what they call a quad chart. And a quad chart is really, think of this as like a one pager. Um, this is a way for them to interact with you. Uh, typically what we recommend is you do the quad chart, reach out to the program director, and then ask for 15 minutes and say, hey, I want to get a sense of how my technology might fit into your mission. So the goal for you in those conversations really should be around understanding their mission and maybe how your technology can fit into your mission. So you're not trying to sell them on the idea. Uh, it's really trying to understand what are their needs, just like you would do with customer discovery. Um, now, keep in mind, uh, many agencies like DOD uh, and NASA that are contracting uh, they're going to have different periods of time where they can't talk to you. So those are kind of the, uh, you know, blackout periods where they can't talk to you. So you might, if you send them a quad chart and they don't respond, and they may respond and just simply say, hey, here's here's a here's a here's somebody that you can ask questions about the application itself, but we can't discuss your, uh, think of that as really more of a purchasing uh, process where they're, they're trying to be fair to everybody. And so they go in that blackout period. And so the, the the four quadrants on this quad chart really is, well, here's my technology, a little bit of overview of what that is. You're not going to put the, you know, the whole kitchen sink in this, just trying to give them the highlights, but still have enough meat that they you pique their interest. Um, and then the lower left quadrant is really the research. This is what I this is what I hope to prove, and this is what the research look might look like. It doesn't have to be finalized but have some sense of this is what I'm going to do. You can't just simply say, I need the money to, you know, build this prototype. You know, no, instead it says, I have to, I want to be able to prove that, you know, X, Y, Z hasn't been able to, this over, if we can overcome this, this opens up a huge market for us. And I need to be able to prove that I can overcome X, Y, Z or increase whatever, or whatever the case is. Uh, and then the upper right uh, quadrant is really your company. You know, who are you? How long you've been around? How many employees you have? And it's okay to to be uh, to be a small company. Um, in fact, NSF, I believe, about ninety percent of the they typically fund about ninety percent of their money goes to startups with less than five employees. So it's okay. Don't be embarrassed about that. Uh, just be. They just want to get a sense of who they're talking to, um, and then also what kind of facilities do you have access to? If you're an existing company or if you're you're proposing that I'm going to lease this other space, you would put that in there. And then the last section, probably the most important, is what's the opportunity? Um, this is an area that many people really falter on. They get really hung up on their science, their technology, um, but they don't they lack the understanding of the marketplace. And this is critical, uh, particularly for NSF. For NIH, for the phase one, it's probably less critical because with NIH, typically you're going to say, you know, hey, I've got this, um, I've got this kind of um, drug or whatever I'm going to do medicine-wise or health-wise for a group of population. And usually that's pretty well known. This many people have diabetes or whatever. But for, for NSF uh, and even really for DOD, they want to understand what is the use case? What is What does this look like outside of DOD? Who else is going to be the customer? What's that dual use? Uh, because particularly for a startup, DOD doesn't want you to be their soul. Uh, they don't want to be their sole, your sole, their, they don't want to be your only customer. So I'm trying to say, um, and then also, you know, who is that target customer? What's that market look like? Um, and then do you want to take this pitch or this, excuse me, instead of a project pitch for those agencies, you'd use this quad chart and you want to then 
uh, reach out to them and get get some get some feedback. So here's kind of a rough timeline uh, in terms of what we what we typically see is you know you develop your quad chart, your project pitch, uh, or or in the case of NIH, they have what they call specific aims. Um, 120 days, that's an approximate. I've seen public tip take longer than that. And then, you know, trying to get that one-on-one -on -one scheduled, uh, it may take more than a couple of emails, identifying who the right person is. They may refer you to somebody else. And then obtaining those registration, you can be doing that really throughout even this time. And then really doing your market research and in, in your customer discovery, also trying to get letters of support. Um, and then, uh, you know, really honing in and revising that technical narrative uh, for your project. You got you to you submit a budget um, and that's, and then you want to kind of give yourself another week. We always tell people if the due date is January 5th, then you should be submitting this, you know, at least by January 1st. Don't wait till the last day. Uh, Sometimes the system will have glitches. There's a whole bunch of people rushing to submit theirs on the last day. And if, if and even if it's not your fault, if the, if the um, uh, website goes down or gets clogged up and it loses your submission, they're not gonna let you submit it late. Uh, so we recommend that you you do that so that you get a confirmation uh, back at least a couple days before the deadline. So here's some for, for our Missouri, uh, since I'm from the Missouri Small Business Development Center, here's my email address. Uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, with more questions or, you're interested in some of our services, we offer one-on-one -on -one counseling. Uh, uh, I focus on tech clients, um, but we've also got other counselors that help other types of businesses. Um, there's a link to all the tutorials. I recommend that you really study those tutorials for your particular agency that you're interested in. We are also offering a, uh, we're a FAST grant um, recipient, uh, federal and state technology grant uh, that promotes uh, phase zero education and phase zero uh, development with grant writing. Um, so we're offering an NSF interactive day and a half workshop, August 16th and 17th. Uh, it was normally it's a $99 fee. We're covering that with our grant. We partner with Biogenerator in St. Louis, and they're also doing an SBIR prep workshop focused on NIH, September 21st and 22nd. I think theirs is also about a day and a half. We also a number of training events. Uh, there's a link there. And then also, if you're in Missouri, we're offering from our phase zero FAST grant, we'll actually fund up to $2,500 for you to bring in a grant writer to help you, um, you know, kind of push that over the finish line. Um, that's typically, that $2,500 would typically cover, you know, their editing and coaching, you doing a lot of the legwork yourself. If you handed them the whole whole project, that's probably more like a ten dollars or $12,000 project. So that $2,500 is really designed for you to, do a lot of the little work yourself, but get a grant writer that can really help you with the language for that particular agency, uh, as well as uh, coaching. Then my uh, counterpart from the Nebraska Business Development Center, I mentioned Josh. Here's Josh's information. So if you're from Nebraska, feel free, feel free to reach out to Josh and a little bit about uh, what Nebraska does. Very similar uh, support that we do in Missouri. So as a reminder, please come join um, me and Josh at the Expo booth. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A then. Thanks and have a great rest of your symposium. Coming up next, we have Wayne Inouye from the Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. Aloha. This, my name is Wayne Inouye from Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm representing HCDC and Innovate Hawaii. Um, before we start this afternoon, I want to just share my contact information. Um, again, Wayne Inouye. My email is winouye at hcdc.org. And a phone number, 808-529-3652. And our website is www.hcdc.org. Just wanted to share that with you. So in case you have any questions um, after this presentation, please feel to call me or email with any questions. All right, so um, who we are. Again, HTDC stands for Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. We are a um, an state agency attached to the state of Hawaii through the Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. 
And our mission is to inspire Hawaii to accelerate businesses' growth with local innovation. Um, just to share a couple of core programs um, here at HCDC, our first program that I'd like to highlight is our HCAP program, which, which stands for the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation and Technologies. And basically what that program um, is, is a partnership with the Air Force to inspire the creation of clean energy through hydrogen. So in the picture, you'll see a um, converted tow tug um, that we developed for the Air Force as a test facility um, that is converted to hydrogen. And we also have a hydrogen fueling tank at uh, our facility out at Joint Base Pearl Harbor. Um, our middle program is a program called the Entrepreneur Sandbox. And it's uh, basically a co-working space that encourages creativity, technology, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And it's a great space for companies that want to get into technology or just a startup or entrepreneurship in general. Is, is a great place for collaboration and for startup companies and for people to meet other people and to network um, in the space of technology and manufacturing. Um, the other thing that we do at the Entrepreneur Sandbox is maybe related to DOD. It, it is the home of the Naval X Hawaii Tech Bridge Program. Uh, we'll go into that a little later um, about what our Tech Bridge Program, but again, it's a really creative space. It's a space for companies, people, again, to get together to, cre to create new creative ideas. Um, the main program that we'll share with you today is called our Innovate Hawaii program. And this is where we get into the, the CIBR programs, the Small Business Innovation Research Program that, uh, that we administer here um, in Hawaii. It is in partnership with NIST MEP. So we are a federally funded program to Department of Commerce, NIST MEP, to promote and to help grow the manufacturing sector for the state of Hawaii. Um, again, as part of the state agency, we are attached to the economic, divi economic divi um, business arm for the state of Hawaii. So those are three main core programs for the state. Um, the next slide I'll show you here is our ecosystem for DOD. Um, partially for what we are kind of sharing with you today is how HCDC actually um, partners with DOD. And this is an example of our partnership with Naval X, the TechBridge program. And it showcases the, the partnerships that we do. So um, as you see on the left-hand side, it, it represents the Department of Defense. Um, we have our NAVC programs. We have our Naval Warfare um, programs here at a Joint Base Pearl Harbor that we work closely with. And um, in the middle is our TechBridge program, which is a U.S. program that um, has about 13 centers across the U.S. that support the, the Naval X program. One key thing that we do um, for the state of Hawaii is we represent the state, the university, and also the industry for a lot of tech companies through our SBIR program. So um, what we are trying to do is connect industry with DOD to solve local um, problems here in Hawaii. And this has been one of the real core programs of trying to solve Hawaii problems with Hawaii tech businesses. Um, we have strategic uh, partnerships with the University of Hawaii, which provide the academia of trying to support these startup companies, but also in partnership with the business school, the innovation center, and also Ensign to provide that mentorship for a lot of our startup companies but also help complete the ecosystem. So um, we are able to directly understand um, our problems that are coming out of uh, the military, out of DOD, but also leverage the TechBridge program, which kind of puts both sides together. So in a nutshell, what HCDC is trying to do is to leverage our um, tech industry, which you see there um, highlighted, and trying to connect them with DOD to solve local DOD problems here in Hawaii. Um, I know it's very high level, but in general, we are trying to make that connection to our industry and the military or to DOD. Here's an example of just our network. So obviously it's not just the state, it's not just the university, but it's a group of, of organizations that we work closely together. 
to help support um, our DOD partners here. So it goes from, again, the university to the Chamber of Commerce to other uh, supportive economic development organizations that really make up the ecosystem to support um, our DOD um, activities here in Hawaii. One program that I've highlighted in our ecosystem is the Hawaii SBR Matching Grant Program. So this is a program that HCDC supports um, through our state matching grant program. The state of Hawaii provides matching grants to our SIBR awardees here in the state. There's three phases, a phase zero, which uh, the state provides up to $3,000 worth of reimbursement to tech, to tech companies. Phase one, up to 50% of their award, up to 75,000. And phase two and phase three, up to 50%, up to 500,000. So the state is really involved and really invested interest to our startup companies to really move tech along to help support our federal agencies. But we leverage this program as part of our ecosystem to help support DOD and move technology to commercialization. For some of you that are familiar with the SBR program, this is just the life cycle. So this, this diagram just shows how some of the matching grant can help assist tech companies partner in this ecosystem. So we support with grant writing, consulting, prototyping, um, all the way to market research. So it just gives our Hawaii companies a, a leverage to help utilize some of the state invested funds into really creating a more robust technology um, pathway to commercialization, which re in return um, really helps our DOD ecosystem here in Hawaii. Um, I know that was really quick. Um, it was very high level, but again, we're very fortunate and we're very honored to be invited to share a little bit about our program with you this afternoon. Um, but if any questions, please feel free to email us at info at hcdc.org. Thank you very much. Coming up next, we have Trent Armbrust, Chief Strategy Officer for the National Security Crossroads. Hello, and it is a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Trent Armbrust. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer with the Kansas Department of Commerce. And I represent a group that has come together to form what we call the National Security Crossroads, which is a joint partnership between Kansas and Missouri and the members of those two states that have chosen to be part of this. And, that rep and that, those members include uh, government, but also economic development professionals, uh, civilian members of, of some of the organizations that we're gonna highlight in a few minutes at federal installations, as well as small businesses. So it's really a cross section uh, that you see at the crossroads and I represent them. And we're gonna tell you a little bit about the story of the National Security Crossroads. Our group of us came together a few years ago and we realized we had this tremendous group of assets in the bi-state region that were um, not really coordinated. And when you bring in the universities that are working with Department of Defense and Innovation, uh, they weren't really coordinated with all these different assets. And so we set about to create an organization that would help coordinate the various national security assets, both DOD and non-DOD, as well as the other entities, such as uh, the universities, economic development organizations and the like. And so what we're trying to do is take this uh, really confusing web and, and siloed approach into a single network that would be scalable so we can continue to add new partners. Uh, we can have those cost savings through best practice sharing and really focus on the talent side of this uh, and also the small businesses. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. So the mission of the National Security Crossroads is to brand the region. So first it's a branding exercise to brand the region as a national security strength and that we're going to help educate uh, individuals, uh, both elected and non-elected on the value of the region, but also the talent that exists in the region on the value of staying in the region and the career opportunities that exist, and then help uh, also share the value of national security crossroads with those assets. So that again, they can share and be part of a larger network. As you can see on the map, uh, this spans in the West from Wichita and Manhattan, Kansas, uh, through the Kansas City metro area and then along that I-70 corridor into St. Louis. 
And this, and I'll touch on some of the specific assets here. Uh, you also see a dotted line up to Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska. While Nebraska is not a formal member of the Crossroads, uh, we do include Offutt and the amazing assets that are up in the Omaha region. So some of those unique national security assets that exist. Uh, MBAF, which is the National Bio and Agro Defense Facility, is located in Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, it's been going through the, the uh, five-year construction process. It opens this fall, uh, and it's the first of its kind in the United States to do level four biosecurity research on agriculture. Uh, the Department of Energy's National Security Campus, which is run by Honeywell in the Kansas City uh, region, and then you have the, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in St. Louis, uh, tremendous assets. Then you add on top of that STRATCOM, uh, all the different common, all the different things that you see on the bottom of the screen there, uh, really string, speak to some of the strengths that we have. Layer on top of that, some of the major military installations that we have in the bi-state region, uh, including Whiteman, uh, Offutt, uh, you've got Fort Leonard Wood in, down in central Missouri and then Scott Air Force Base on the east side of St. Louis and then Fort Riley, McConnell, Fort Leavenworth. You have a tremendous amount of knowledge. You also have a tremendous number of transitioning military members as they exit their career in the military and their service is of great value to the national security assets in the region as they transition into civilian roles. And we wanna make sure that we work with those transitioning soldiers and military members. So this is the slide that really where all of this starts to come together. Uh, if, if you see at the top again, the members of the National Security Crossroads are really those uh, groups that are at the top. You have nonprofits, you have your academic, your university partners, community colleges and the like. Uh, industry partners uh, that are gonna, especially on the small business side, they're gonna to wanna to participate in this, but we also anticipate some of the larger industry partners joining us. Uh, the VC and PE groups that are looking at investing in those innovative businesses that are uh, in the national security uh, really ecosystem. Then you have the different economic development partnerships and the chambers of commerce. And then you've got the Missouri Department of Economic Development and the Kansas Department of Commerce this group together creates the National Security Crossroads membership, and then we work closely with our uh, federal members. Uh, and again, you can see those. So we're trying to have this where we bring everything together so we can uh, unlock the value, as you see on the left side of the screen, of sharing those best practices, uh, hiring veterans, uh, sharing cybersecurity best practices. We've already seen some of that uh, through our efforts of connecting different federal agencies and saying, okay, how did you do this? All right, this is how we accomplished this, or security clearance is another issue that's, that really plagues the nation. How can we be really, really good at that in the Midwest? Uh, and then retention of talent, uh, recruiting um, more assets to the in the federal sector, and then uh, supply chain. So our objectives in the national security crossroads, we wanna develop the workforce, the talent development. We want to continue to, again, help retain what's already here, but attract more talent to the National Security Crossroads region. Uh, cyber and secure supply chain collaboration. Uh, we've all seen the se severe disruption of supply chain and the effects it has. That's been talked about for a long time in the national security arena, and uh, it continues to be a problem that's being exacerbated by the current global supply chain challenges. Uh, increase federal agency interaction. Uh, again, we want to see our, our installations be the best at what they do at the lowest cost. And we know that gives us a competitive advantage in the long term to continue to retain that federal mission, but also grow the federal mission. And then lastly, we want to improve access to the supply chain and small business suppliers. Again, this is well documented. Uh, and we feel like that through intentional action as a as a cooperative, a, a bi-state cooperative, the National Security Crossroads, we can strengthen that small business supplier chain and really make Kansas and Missouri the home of uh, innovation and of trusted and competent supply chain members for the national security missions. So what is the Crossroads? Uh, as I talked about earlier, we're a branding effort. 
uh, first and foremost. Uh, we want to recognize that those existing federal mission assets and then help educate our state and federal legislators is to make sure that they understand what they have in their own backyard and how they can advocate on behalf of the mission of those assets and strengthen the collective national security ecosystem in the bi-state region. Uh, facilitate workforce initiatives and growth. Uh, again, this is really, really key. Uh, we've seen the starvation for, for talent across the nation. National security is no different. Uh, collaboration on different topics. Uh, we've already started hosting quarterly webinars to highlight the assets in different regions so that we have greater awareness and that will foster collaboration. And then how we can allow the states and the local entities as they go through economic development processes to use the brand and to use the data to help with their efforts. Importantly, what are we not as a national security crossroads? We're not a legal entity that is out there taking all these different actions such as lobbying and things like that. Uh, we're not a job board. We're not gonna be a central depository where everyone lists their jobs in national security, uh, but we wanna help facilitate the creation of job boards if that's what's necessary. Uh, a re we're not a replacement for state military offices and setting direction. Uh, we're not part of a, you know, we're not a development of strategy for local or city economic development. And we don't do economic development RFP responses. Although the data that we create, the assets that we highlight, the collaboration, all of that will be key components when a local or a state goes after a economic development project through an RFP response. So uh, what are we doing now? We're going, we've applied for an OLDCC grant for $600,000 to hire a professional uh, firm to help run the National Security Crossroads and then do the asset mapping and SWOT analysis and develop a long-term strategic plan so that we have, and then an action plan so we can move forward. Uh, both the state of Kansas and the state of Missouri have submitted matching grants. So with that, I thank you for your time. Uh, the nationalsecuritycrossroads.com is where you can find more information. And there's my contact information if you have any questions after this presentation. Thank you. And now coming up, we have another X-Force alum uh, presentation, this time by Henry Gorlick. I've had an amazing experience as an X-Force fellow this summer. I'm supporting the Missouri Army National Guard in their implementation of holistic health and fitness, which is the Army's modernized doctrine for soldier readiness. Through interviews and online research, we're trying to get a full picture of the existing holistic health and fitness framework within the Missouri National Guard, and then identify next steps for implementation. To support the completion of my project, the X-Force Fellowship has provided me with the opportunity to take two trips one to Missouri and one to Washington, DC. During my trip to Missouri, I had the opportunity to visit and speak with service members at Jefferson Barracks, Ike Skelton Training Site, Whiteman Air Force Base, and Rosecrans Air National Guard Base. I even had the opportunity to tour a B-2 stealth bomber to my, during my visit at Whiteman Air Force Base. On our trip to DC, I had the opportunity to collaborate with, the, with another X-Force team that's working on a similar project and meet with more service members, but this time at National Guard Bureau. These trips were incredibly important to the progress of my project, and I am very thankful for the National Security and Innovation Network and the X-Force Fellowship for making them possible. In addition to supporting the completion of my own project, the National Security Innovation Network and the X-Force Fellowship has allowed me to connect with other individuals who are passionate about contributing to national security and also learn about potential career paths from experts every Friday as a part of our weekly speaker series. This program has given me the opportunity to work with an amazing team that has supported me every step of the way. My team includes my project sponsors, Major Dorothy McClelland and Lieutenant Christopher Barrett, and my National Security Innovation Network point of contact, Mike Sieber. Most importantly, the X-Force Fellowship has provided me with a unique opportunity to serve my country and work directly on a real world Department of Defense challenge. I would absolutely recommend this opportunity to anybody who is interested in working towards innovations in the national security and uh, national security and national service space. And I'm incredibly thankful that I've had this experience. The next two videos are Ensign alum who have participated in our acceleration program, acceleration programs. Uh, the next one coming up is the Titan Corporation. 
Hi, my name is Cameron Sargent, and I am a recent alum of the Ensign Emerge Accelerator. My team and I have developed a breakthrough platform technology for polymerizing proteins inside of bacteria that will allow us to take advantage of sustainable and scalable microbial fermentation methods to produce organic polymer materials. Fibers made from one of these polymerized proteins, Titan, which is naturally found in muscles, have displayed exciting properties in the lab, such as high strength and toughness. Based on these properties, we are now exploring their application in markets, such as alternative proteins and food additives, biomedical materials like sutures and surgical meshes, and high-performance textiles for defense and transportation. The DECO team and Ensign Emerge Accelerator have given us the knowledge, resources, and connections we need to take our technology to the next level. We learned a lot about the intricacies and unique elements of working with the military and other government agencies to establish funding and partnerships. The Accelerator's curriculum and workshops have helped us develop our pitch and marketing materials, business plan, and even an initial contact list of market experts and government stakeholders through which we have already began to explore new funding and partnership opportunities. We're grateful to have had this tremendous opportunity ourselves and hope that many others are able to take advantage of it moving forward. Welcome back. This will be our last video before a break. Uh, this is Blazing Audio with their experience in the acceleration portfolio and programs. Hi, my name is David Charlot representing Blazing Audio. Let me tell you about our wonderful startup company that's going to really revolutionize the field of physical therapy. The coronavirus pandemic was a global catastrophe that affected many lives in uh, a very detrimental ways. The field of physical therapy was also significantly harmed. As you see in these pictures, a lot of uh, training facilities, but nobody there. Fortunately, there are uh, opportunities for in-home remote physical therapy. But as you talk to physical therapists who participated in uh, remote telemedicine, they kind of pointed out you can't really bring the real in, in uh, clinic experience home. It's just kind of not possible today. But what if it is? Uh, what if there's a way to bring remote touch and other types of capabilities to the home that allows physical therapy to actually be experienced? That's what we're doing at Blazing Audio. We're using gaming technology to solve real world problems and actually implement it to solve challenges in physical therapy. We've had a great customer discovery journey talking to over 150 people about the use case. And they've all said, wow, this sounds like it's from Star Trek. But what they also said is, how easy is it to install? It's not gonna replace all physical therapy, but there are applications that will definitely benefit. Following that understanding, we also looked into market research and found that that's actually a large opportunity. So what we're building at Blazing Audio is a hardware as a service platform that allows physical therapists to handle common uh, uh, physical therapy injuries, such as rotator cuff, wrist and ankle, uh, remotely with the same care and precision that they can do in the clinic. In terms of the landscape for hardware and apps related to physical therapy, we're not the first to come up with the idea of using existing technology to solve uh, problems with healthcare. What we're doing is using hardware that allows Midair Haptics to really change and provide touch for physical therapy. We have a great team at Blazing Audio. I myself have a PhD in bioengineering and a lot of years experience uh, developing startup companies to solve problems in human health. We're also joined by Zavosh and Amber who have great expertise in data analytics, as well as in building companies and selling them. We're also joined by a fantastic team of advisors. Thanks for allowing me to give an overview of Blazing Audio. Uh, love to give hear your thoughts and feedback. Please reach out. Well, everyone, we're going to transition to a break now. Please come back at five past the hour. That's 105 Eastern, 1205 Central. And we will meet you back when we will come back to company and vendor presentations, uh, which will include some of our investor companies. Thank you, see you then. F remember, five past the hour. Welcome back. And now we're doing company and vendor presentations. Next up, we have Sarah Myers, who is the CEO of LV. 
describing her company. And then later on, you'll see her. She gives you a testimonial of uh, some of the things that uh, some of the uh, programs that she's been involved in. Hello, I'm Sarah Myers, and together with Bobby Azuda, we make up LV Performance Technologies. I'm going to provide an overview of our technology that provides performance vision for your lower legs. Musculoskeletal injuries are common and costly. For example, 45% of new military recruits have a lower leg injury in basic training, and up to 50% of runners have an injury each year. This leads to big financial cost, $19.2 billion annually for the Department of Defense and $37.2 billion annually for runners. There's also lost duty days in the military, 8 million total duty days for the DOD, and training days in runners, 56 days per person on average for every injury. Our solution is LV, an integrated insole and ankle package that enables real-time monitoring in any training environment. LV brings the biomechanics lab to the field. Its two patented technologies were developed in MIT Lincoln Labs, and we hold exclusive options to the licenses. The idea is that LV can be worn and used to monitor for adverse changes in movement patterns. Then that would alert the user of potential injury or fatigue onset that could impact performance. Our business model is designed to coincide with the current stage of our product development, including moving from the initial use case in the military to other use cases we believe are a great fit. We are currently in phase one, working with the Defense Health Agency and MIT Lincoln Labs to build and validate 10 devices initially. With this data, our team can develop performance metrics in the user interface, enabling organizational adoption by athletic teams and the military. We will interface two by providing 100 pairs of LV to the Marine Expeditionary Rifle Squad and we will be able to then sell to other DOD customers. Phase three will transition to include a direct to consumer model with most of our revenue coming from product sales. We expect to offer services and will have consumer data that is also marketable. We also expect to have white label licensing opportunities. LV is the only solution that meets durability requirements that are needed to truly use the device in the field or real world setting while providing biomechanics lab quality data. The devices listed here have considerable measurement limitations and even research grade insoles cannot offer true force measurements or even come close to LV's durability. Here's an overview of what we are currently working on. Highlights include funding for our own prototypes, being able to complete the prototype testing for MIT Lincoln Labs because of our access to Nebraska resources, aggressive grant submissions with LV Performance Technologies as the lead, but also collaborations with Results Group, another small business featuring exoskeleton technologies. Finally, we are selectively pursuing other accelerator opportunities that would provide funding and business development support, as well as continuing our own research and development efforts. Bobby and I make up our founding team. His expertise in engineering, rapid product development, and successfully leveraging non-dilutive SBIR grants complement my biomechanics, human performance, and research expertise. We have a passion for LV because we believe it has huge potential across multiple use cases. We've been fortunate to have support from these three advisors. Joe is the original inventor. He wants to see this product launch and has assisted and supported us every step of the way. Brian Cross has experience in developing startups, continues to make himself available to support us. Mark Condiles was our original accelerator coach, and he continues to connect us with helpful resources, including furthering our DOD and health connections.
LV Performance Technologies was spun out of Ensign's Defense Innovation Accelerator, now known as Foundry. The LV team was partnered with technology inventor Joe Lacranola and industry mentors to explore DOD athletics and medical use cases. LV won the 2021 showcase event concluding the four-month program. In the fall of 2021, LV Performance Technologies was incorporated and an option license agreement with MIT Lincoln Labs was executed. Since then, LV has completed the Ensign Vector program where LV took the Audience Choice and Dunk Hard Awards for overall performance. LV was awarded an Ensign Maker prototyping grant recently to further develop DOD use cases. Besides the support of Ensign, LV has been pursuing research and development funding opportunities. LV completed Ensign's SBIR Sprint and the National Institutes of Health Application Assistance Program submitting an SBIR proposal for each. LV also made it to the top 20 for the Stadia Accelerator application process, the leading sports and esports accelerator program in the world. LV is currently participating in the National Institute on Aging Healthy Aging Startup Challenge. LV has been issued subawards to support existing biomechanics research. Thank you for listening and I look forward to any questions. Coming up next is Jad Miauchi, CTO and co-founder of Bad VR, who, by the way, uh, is a winner of one of our recent uh, hacks iterations. Now on to Jad. Hi, my name is Jad Miyushi from Bad VR. I'm the co-founder and CTO. Uh, a little bit about my background: I've been coding for years since I was a kid. All kinds of stuff: data analytics, databases, games and uh, recently have become really interested and passionate about immersive technologies, AR, VR. And so our company, Bad VR, stands for Bring All Your Data Into VR, and we do data visualization using augmented reality and virtual reality. So the problem that we are trying to solve is how do you take lots and lots of data that everybody has and convert it into decisions? And data is typically of this format of, you know, big giant blocks of text and numbers and uh, uh, heavy, heavy data, it's gigabytes and petabytes and terabytes of information. Um, it often requires interacting with data scientists, which can be an adventure in itself. The tools that we've been using to look at information and present that information like charts and graphs and dashboards you know, some of these tools are hundreds of years old, like the bar graph, for example, is from two or 300 years ago, or even thousands of years ago, depending on your perspective. So it feels like the whole process is very slow and it takes a while to really get the meat out of it. So we have a different approach or we have a different vision of all of this, which is to make this analytics platform completely immersive so that you're looking at things in 3D, 3D things in 3D. So it's collaborative, it's very lightweight, it's sort of what you see in this photo here, or this concept photo of all these decision makers crowding around this holographic presentation of information. This is something that you might see in a science fiction movie, but this is actually starting to become real. And so what we've built is, is in this direction of this device agnostic, uh, you know, really intuitive and easy to use interface that people can have to communicate with data and about data. And we've realized it as two specific products. So we have the Augmented Reality Operations Center, codename, nickname, AROC. And this is kind of like the op center in a box. This is the, the virtual environment, like what you saw on the previous screen, with the goal to really enhance people's awareness of the information of what's going on in, in a live setting or in sort of a training setting really bring down that cognitive load of when you have lots and lots of information coming at you, depending on how the information is presented, it can either be a burden or it can be an enhancement. And so our focus is on using psychological techniques, uh, cognitive processing and cognitive uh, load testing, and of course, user interface and usability, UI, UX, to really build interfaces to data that are really easy and, and uh, intuitive and, and fast more than anything else. The other product we have is called C-Signal 
where you put on a headset and you can actually see radio signals in the room around you live, kind of like x-ray vision. Again, very science fiction, very out there, but it exists and it's real and you can try it and demo it. So this is all about discovering patterns of data, of signals as they propagate through the real world or, or communicating with somebody, hey, this is how this signal is shaped. Uh, and also on the commercial side, helping to reduce the cost of deployments by really putting equipment in the right place and understanding what's happening and how it's shaping. Of course, there are other use cases for this as well that we'll get into. But on the op center side, this is all about looking at information that usually has a geospatial context. So looking at space data, looking at uh, uh, buildings and 3D buildings and public records data, and looking at the weather and IoT data. And with the weather, we have a relationship with NOAA through a grant an SBIR, where we're bringing in their 3D multi-dimensional NEXRAD Doppler radar data and making it completely interactive on the map. So you've got this, this giant immersive VR map in front of you, kind of like a Google Earth, but then you can bring in live 3D weather and start to manipulate it and say, okay, show me when the, the radial velocity is above a certain threshold. Okay, show me when precipitation is, is really low but increasing. And so it gives you this, this hand-based interaction with all of this data uh, that's, that's floating around, that's live data that has an impact on people and, and, and personnel and, and uh, uh, you know, equipment and vehicles. And so there's a lot of different use cases, a lot of different scenarios for something like this. And our goal is to build that environment to enable and empower all those users. On the sort of cybersecurity side, we have a, a CIBR with the Air Force that is all about looking at information that's uh, network-based. So looking at network status and meta information about networks, what networks are down, what routes to networks are down, how do we do a root cause analysis to find out what's going on. So they built their own sort of custom environment uh, using the system and then started to put all the cyber data into it. Um, and so looking at dependencies and all of this fun stuff. So a little bit more about the C signal side of things. So this is all about how, again, you can visualize wireless signals and, and trace things and find them. And so on the perspective of uh, a use case for this, or where did this all come from, is TSCM and technical surveillance countermeasures and electronic warfare. When we look at spectrum, we look at it as a new horizon or a new battlefield. And there are increasing attacks in there that can get very creative and very disruptive. And as you have things like utilities and utility infrastructures that are increasingly connected, uh, these are starting to become targets as well through all the different vectors and channels. So we look at the traditional approach to all of this as being a little bit, a little complicated. It's a, it can be very distracting also. So you're running around staring at a, a spectrum analyzer screen, and that's not necessarily the best thing to do when you're out in the field. Uh, with a lot of things happening around you, uh, you want to be laser focused on the area uh, within your field of view, not necessarily looking down and staring at a screen. And also the whole process of chasing signals can be very tedious and you've got large physical equipment that you're running around a, a room and building with. It's not very discreet. It doesn't necessarily feel very modern. Um, and again, a lot of the methods haven't changed in decades. So our goal is to find a different way to provide the situational awareness, you know, this spectrum awareness, which is using holographic uh, representation and also, you know, hands interfaces, really just using augmented reality to paint that stuff into, into the world around you uh, where the signal actually is and be able to navigate, to find the signal, to lock onto something, to see packet traffic flowing and see, oh, these two devices are talking to each other they're not supposed to be talking to each other or this device is, uh, is phoning, phoning some IP address in another country and that's not supposed to be happening either. So it's all about taking data that's really, really relevant to the user and bringing it into their field of view so that they can uh, still exist and walk around and, and see that information. So when you talk about it in sort of battlefield context, you have this concept of a soldier of the future and they're probably going to have some form of holographic display. Maybe it's not going to be a big headset or a helmet, but maybe eventually it's going to be something really small and really thin and light. 
and we're experimenting with those as well. And we've got relationships with uh, a lot of different uh, defense agencies and organizations. Um, so testing out all of this different equipment and figuring out, you know, what is the what is the real world application of this technology and how can we use it to, to get an edge? And so this is a, a little bit of a vision of, of where this is going. This is an actual screenshot of one user looking at another user as they're both using it. And they actually did find what they were looking for in this sort of training scenario. So a little bit about the company. We're a woman owned small business based in the Los Angeles area. There's, there's 20 of us total. Um, Suzanne is our, our fearless leader and, and has the vision of all of this. Um, and then we've just got a really good team of creative people from all walks of life, um, all coming together to build sort of the next generation of, of computing and the next generation of uh, display technology um, and software and, and all of that. So if you want to reach out to us, we're, we're available. We're interested in hearing about uh, your ideas and, and uh, concepts, and, and we'd love to show you a, a live demo of stepping inside of your data and show you what what we believe is is the future of information and information presentation. So thank you very much. And my name is Jad Miyushi, and uh, thanks for listening. All right, continuing on, you'll see a group of different companies, some of which are investment companies and venture capitalists. We've got Jason Grease, Ecosystem Director with Innovate Pittsburgh. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Grease. I'm the Ecosystem Director for Innovate PGH, a public-private partnership in Pittsburgh that is working to accelerate, elevate, and unify Pittsburgh's innovation ecosystem. Today, I'll give you an overview of our organization and our work and I will give you a deep dive into one of our primary digital products that we call Astri that serves to unify the innovation ecosystem assets. I wanna start by talking about Pittsburgh and what people associate with Pittsburgh when I talk to them about it. So many people say things like the Steelers or the industrial economy, and many people don't know that in the last three decades, the leadership in the private, the public, and the philanthropic sectors in the region have worked to build a thriving innovation economy powered by university assets. As you can see on the map here, this is just a snippet of the corporates, the startups, and the mature tech companies that we have working in Pittsburgh in some way. All of these companies have a physical presence in the city. In the middle of that map, you'll see an orange outline, and that's what we call the Pittsburgh Innovation District. And the Pittsburgh Innovation District came about because in 2017, a lot of the efforts around the innovation economy by the leaders I mentioned earlier converged in this report that you see on the right side of the screen called Capturing the Next Economy, Pittsburgh's Rise as a Global Innovation City. And the key takeaway of that report is that due to the proximity of our three most significant research anchors in Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Pittsburgh has a naturally occurring innovation district. And Innovate PGH was set up because we thought with a little coordination, we could help accelerate the commercialization process out of both universities, densify innovation assets in the district and connect underserved Pittsburghers around the innovation district to the university driven economy. Just to give you a little closer look of the innovation district, it's really about a square mile. So in the pink here, you can see the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center assets. The blue is the University of Pittsburgh. And towards the right side of the screen, the red is Carnegie Mellon University. So within a, a 10 minute walk, you can get to all three major research institutions in the city. And the neighborhood of Oakland that the innovation district resides in is one of the densest, it's one of the most transit rich, it's one of the most exciting neighborhoods to be in during the daytime and more and more during the nighttime. But our work is really around the innovation ecosystem. So we sort of separate ourselves into two primary entities. One is Innovate PGH and the other is the Pittsburgh Innovation District. So Innovate PGH is really focused on being a concierge of sorts to anyone who's interested in startups, or research or investment around innovation. The image on the left side of the screen shows you the types of partners we work with. 
It could be accelerators or incubators. It could be public sector entities or regional economic development partners. And it can be university entrepreneurship centers or big healthcare systems like UPMC or Highmark Health. On the right side of the screen, you see our primary focus on place. So the Pittsburgh Innovation District is really focused on densifying innovation assets in a physical way in the Oakland neighborhood. And that takes coordination between the University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So with all these partners, you have a lot of activity happening that takes just a little bit of coordination to really accelerate. So our focus areas here are really about these three primary things. So one is on the left side, ecosystem coordination. That means ecosystem products like Astri, which I'll talk about next, but also doing the blocking and tackling of collective impact, which means convening entrepreneurship support organizations, talking through shared challenges, developing shared goals, and really trying to just build those relationships so that people are working together, even if it's in an ad hoc informal way and not a, a structured way that we might wanna see. And of course that micro ecosystem in the university, which really means the entrepreneurs that are spinning out of the university, the support organizations and centers at those universities and the faculty themselves, which are generating cutting edge research being the concierge helps streamline the, uh, the connections between the outside world and the universities. In the middle, the innovation district is super focused on real estate assets. So what that means is we actually operate two co-working spaces and the idea is to build a full stack of startup growth space, which means from the flex desks onto private offices or full suites we try to provide a space for people in Oakland. It also means the infrastructure and amenities around what makes a vibrant neighborhood. So we work to improve or influence the zoning, the transit and the other housing amenities that make it a great place to live and play as well as work. And finally, it sort of means branding and marketing that innovation district. On the right side, you'll see the workforce side of what we do. Oakland, as I've said, is a vibrant economy. It is driven by the universities, but the neighborhoods around Oakland do not look like Oakland. So the Innovation District Skills Alliance is a cohort-based program that tries to get Pitt, CMU, and eventually other big employers in the neighborhood to hold roles that we train people for so they become the most competitive applicants for those roles. Our workforce director is also really interested in inclusive innovation and is trying to get more and more traction at the universities around experiential learning opportunities for people who don't have the resources and connections that others might. So the big topic I want to I want to touch on before I leave you all is ASTRI. ASTRI stands for Access to Startups, Tech, Research, and Investment. And it is a tool that we created and launched back in April to be a central portal for out-of-market investors, corporates, and others to explore Pittsburgh's innovation ecosystem. What we sort of conceptualize as out-of-market is people who are outside our 10-county region, people who might not know what's happening in Pittsburgh. So the way that Astri is set up is it's one website with two analogous databases. Phase one, which is a screenshot you see on the right, is around startups and scale-ups themselves, and that covers the 10-county region. And phase two, which we're in development, is around intellectual property. So sometimes corporates and others might want to be even further upstream on the development of commercializable opportunities. And so intellectual property coming out of the universities is something we think we'll, they'll be interested in. Developing Astri as is challenging and it continues to be a really interesting journey. We started with an 18 month long process of data entry and working with our partners in DealRoom. DealRoom is a sort of data aggregator for startups that is like Crunchbase, it's like PitchBook, except they focus much more on the startups themselves and less on the investment deal flow. What we think Astri has become already and can become even more in the future is a streamlined tool for scouting capabilities for interested parties and local partners. So right now what we've seen is that 
if someone who's outside of Pittsburgh or is in Pittsburgh just unfamiliar with the innovation ecosystem, if they want to get more information, they might reach out to a specific person at one of our major partners, whether it's an accelerator or university, and that person then goes on sort of a scouting mission for them. They do a few hours of research. They come back with a list of startups that those people might be interested in, that that corporate might be interested in, and then they provide that list to them. We now have a tool that creates a process that does all of that within 30 seconds and basically gives the corporate innovation scouts or the investors or whoever might be the full control over what they're interested in and how to navigate it. So I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes I have here talking through and showing you the capabilities of Astri. So the first thing you see is the dashboard. You see startups, you see rounds, and you see jobs. On the left side, you can control the benefits or the sort of introduction to the ecosystem. And then you can see the actual regional dashboard, which is what we see here. So this is our 10 county region. I've just clicked into Allegheny County. So you can start filtering and immediately you see the, the user interface of the deal room product being a really powerful tool for anyone to quickly navigate the ecosystem. The other really powerful thing you can do is become a curator of your ecosystem. So we have a robotics cluster here in Pittsburgh. I created a list of the robotics companies that I think are super interesting and are changing the future of the industry. And I can see in aggregate their enterprise value. And I can also click into specific startup profiles, which I do with Gecko Robotics here. So Gecko Robotics just raised their Series C. They're really successful in Pittsburgh. They just have a new office. But if I want to go in and I want to see what industry they're working in, I can do that really easily. If I want to see their analytics on the website, if I want to see their investment, and I, as an analyst, someone who has enhanced permissions, can see their tech stack and their founders as well. The other big thing that you can do is the filters on industry. So if I'm immediately interested in something like artificial intelligence, I can click artificial intelligence, and within my pool, it'll give this tool will give me a list of startups that I might be interested in. Finally, you can, you can look at the ecosystem as a broader perspective. So I can touch into the universities here and I can see alums that have founded companies. I can see direct spin outs as well. And those two things create the opportunity to create connections that aren't necessarily on strict business value. You can create networks of people who have different connections than just pure transactional business, and you can give them the opportunity to connect. So I can now pull a list of all of my Carnegie Mellon University alum founders and decide to get them together in a room, or I can pull a list of all of them that are just working in robotics or artificial intelligence. So that, in a very short way, is, is the power of Astri that streamlines everything that we're doing at Innovate PGH when it comes to connecting and unifying the ecosystem. If you want to learn more about Innovate PGH, please come to our website. If you want to learn more about Astri or you just want to poke around, please come to astripittsburgh.com. And if you want to talk to me and ask me how, how I've done anything that I've, I'm doing now, please reach out to me at jg at innovatepgh.com. Thanks again for having me. Coming up next is Steve Miller, the Director of Government Solutions at Aperture. Hello, my name is Steve Miller. I'm with Avature. We're a software development firm here in Omaha, Nebraska, and one of our main sectors is the Department of Defense, specifically Air Force and other branches, and we bring an entrepreneurship attitude to our support to the DOD. My history is I've been in this industry for about 25 years, starting with software engineering for the Air Force as an airman, did defense contracting, spent about a decade with a small business innovative research firm until I landed here at Avature for another decade, helping bring innovation to the warfighter. A little bit about Avature is our goal is to partner with difference makers to unlock the art of the possible. We are not the champion. You are. And we want to make sure that we're helping you unlock the art of the possible and leave nothing on the table. What's our topographic landscape look like? As I mentioned, we're headquartered here in Omaha, Nebraska, but we do have folks remote before it was cool. We're all over the place to include Vegas, Oregon, quite a few places in Texas. 
and on the East Coast as well. We have roughly 100 employees. And in addition to supporting the Department of Defense, we also support the commercial markets. We love the cross-pollination between the engineering staff, industry best practices on the commercial side, working with startups and large enterprise organizations, and bringing those industry best practices to pair for the Department of Defense, where it can be life-saving technologies and implementations. We are an agile software development shop, and that can take the form of Scrum, Kanban, or other forms of agile software development. Some of our accolades and our background is we've been in business since 2004, and we've won several awards to include a two-time recipient of the Military Achievement Award for USGIF, the geospatial technology that we helped the, develop, the government develop. We're not just a front-end shop. We have the full stack to include native cloud development, uh, DevOps, mobile application development, which you'll see later on, system integrations. Obviously, the Department of Defense has a huge data challenge for integration and analysis. We can help there as well. So why the government? Why did Avature focus our energy from 2004 on the government client? Well, you, they have some very unique challenges that have global impacts, and that's attractive to us. We want to create impact. It's one of our core values. They also lack the resources in-house to do some of these challenges, and the demand is overwhelming. So we are able to partner with them to create that impact. And what's the power of the entrepreneur? Why entrepreneurs? Well, most entrepreneurs, the ones that are successful like Avature, are driven. We are motivated and passionate about the mission to bring that impact. We're also lean. While there may be advantages of larger corporations, Avature is nimble and agile, just like our software development practices, and I'm sure you are as well. It also affords us to be innovative. We can risk failure, fail fast, learn from it, and bring impactful solutions to bear for the DoD. Hopefully that's true about you as well. But at the end of the day, it's not actually our size that's valuable, it's our value that's valuable. And so a part of this conversation today is to encourage you to understand your value and sell that, not your size. Now, as an entrepreneur, there is an enemy. A lot of entrepreneurs face limited resources, which can be a challenge. You're also driven, which means you're probably overworking, which means you might be struggling from exhaustion. And lastly, doubt is just rampant. You might be dealing with imposter syndrome, or you might be struggling from some early losses Definitely, we need to combat that enemy and overcome it. So what are some of the resources to tackle the enemy? Well, organizations like Ensign, there is a plethora of them out there, and they're willing to help you. For us, why Omaha? I'm passionate about the entrepreneur landscape here in Austin. It exists in Silicon Valley. It exists down in Austin, Texas. We're passionate about the tech community here in Omaha, which lets us partner with other innovative entrepreneurial organizations here. And as a way to exercise that, we have The Garage. The Garage by Avature is a small business incubator where we invest development resources, dollars, and mentorship to help bring your innovative ideas to life. We can help buy down risk, improve market viability. We can get that early beta launch out and get the client rolling. One of my favorite success stories from the garage is LifeLoop. A local husband and wife duo came in seeking to solve a problem within the assisted living community. They couldn't talk to the caregiver of their family member. So they had a concept and idea to develop software that connected the caregiver to the resident to the family members. Now, we sent them back out of the garage with a lot of homework. Six months later, they came back with their early adopter, more of the value proposition identified, and we were ready to roll. We contribute mentorship, investment dollars, and development resources to get their beta launch out the door, and they took it from there. They've since left the garage as a protege company. They've won multiple awards, and they're now in 48 states and international, and were recently just acquired. So great, successful startup, uh, entrepreneur, and they're well on their way. When you're looking at entrepreneurial efforts, it's really important to understand the players or the stakeholders. First of all, you have a client whom you're trying to help. They have the challenge and the problem you can help them solve. You're also a stakeholder. How do you define success? What's in it for you so that you can identify that as well? Oftentimes, the customer, especially with the DoD, is not the client. The person managing the program is 
ultimately not going to be the person using the program. So you need to understand how they define success as well. There's usually a third stakeholder on the government side, which is who's funding this effort. That could be different. Ultimately, it's best if you find a champion, someone that can be in those government rooms on your behalf and champion the innovation that you're bringing to bear. You also may need other industry partners like some of those mature large corporations that can help on the sustainment side of things or to help uh, resourcing, which we've identified as an earlier enemy. You also need to know who your competitors are. As an entrepreneur, eventually you're gonna pop on somebody's radar and I need you to understand your differentiator and value better than your enemy does, better than your competitor does. All right, one of the innovations we were able to bring to bear specifically for the Air Force was the Aim High mobile app. This is hosted in Cloud One in an IL-4 environment, and it's to equip recruiters with mobile lead capture and to help advertise the Space Force and Air Force job opportunities. It's for folks in the awaiting training category so that they can start to push that training left and get memory work, physical exercise to make sure they're going to be successful when they go to basic training. And lastly, it's for the family members, friends, and general public to observe their journey through basic training and learn more about the Air Force themselves. This innovation was actually brought to life through AFWorks Austin in partnership with Air Force Recruiting Service and other entities to identify the art of the possible, pave a pathway to make it real, and then bring it to life. You can find it on the Apple Store and the Google Play Store today. One of the other challenges with entrepreneurship is the demand. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but don't waste energy swinging at something that's not actually a nail. One of the other innovations we brought to bear with the Air Force was CQMAP, or Contingency Quarters Management Accountability Platform. This actually took us a couple of years to fully identify and spec out to make sure that our hammer was fit for their nail. We used the Small Business Innovative Research Program, which I encourage you to find out more about, and we were able to bring this to life, software as a service owned by the military, equipping our 3F1 services airmen to help those folks deployed get good rest and be ready to fight. Also, as an entrepreneur, I encourage you to identify your risk. Risk isn't always bad, but you need to define it. I encourage you to embrace risk. You uniquely are positioned to embrace and manage risk more quickly and effectively than some of our large counterparts. I also encourage you to identify ways to minimize risk, the likelihood and the impact of a risk materializing as you pursue your solution for the government. One of the ways that we did this was U.S. Strategic Command needing to visualize their nuclear strike options. They had complex data sets through various disparate services and data stores. We were able to integrate, to buy down technical risk, visualize, to buy down user risk, and then show them a way to pursue that prototype to buy down organizational risk. Again, value is super important. As a part of that value, we encourage you to be the guide, not the hero. The last example I have for you is Guardian, which is for the tactical situation display with the remotely piloted aircraft. You're looking at a ground control station with disparate data, multiple displays, multiple partners collaborating to help stop bad guys from doing bad things. This is a web-based application that integrates with streaming data, data at rest, intelligence data, and real-time situational awareness. Hopefully, with all of that in your back pocket, you're now positioned to sell your value. The takeaways I'd like to leave you with is you have unique value. Make sure you can identify it and articulate it well. The government needs what you have to offer, so fight that imposter syndrome and doubt and swing hard. You uniquely have the ability to create impact for our government partners. So take that shot because you're capable. If you have any questions or would like to circle back for more information, again, my name's Steve Miller. I'm the Director of Government Solutions here at Aventure. My contact information is on the screen and I thank you for your time. And welcome back once again, we have four separate uh, financier, uh, venture capitalist uh, presentations upcoming. The first one of which is St. Louis Archangels with Brian Kinman. The CEO. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Kinman, Chairman and CEO of the St. Louis Archangels. 
I'm pleased to be here with you today to be able to talk a little bit about the St. Louis Archangels and how it will interact with our local startup ecosystem. The St. Louis Archangels are a network of accredited investors. As Archangel members, we invest individually, yet collectively for more influence. We highlight this because it's important to understand we are not a fund. We do not have a pool of monies that a small group decides how to invest. We are a network of members who decide individually whether or not they want to invest. They, and in doing so individually, they will collaborate with other members, and many times the, the investments can be quite substantial. Our organization has, we maintain our organization at a 70 to 80 member base. We are currently in our 19th year of operation. We were really one of the founding uh, organizations for the current St. Louis startup ecosystem, the first formal funding organization in that ecosystem. We've invested in uh, over 130 different enterprises in our time um, uh, together. And the total amount of our investment now exceeds over $110 million. So it's a substantial source of investment uh, on behalf of the entrepreneurs uh, in, in the St. Louis region. Um, our niche um, is very important. And I wanted to go over this today because so many of the entrepreneurs always want to understand and, and think through this. Where do we come in as Archangels and how do we stay engaged? Obviously, as, as you all begin your journey as entrepreneurs, uh, you know, we're looking for you to be really self-funded. How did you get started? Did you put money in, time and effort, family funds, that sort of thing that are a part of it? The second level of investment, many times, but not all the time, are going to be more formal organizations like accelerators, where an individual will be able to get obtain some mentoring to help formalize the business the marketing strategy, to go to market, the tool, the customer base, whatever it may be that needs to be improved to get the business really ready to, to go to business and, and to be successful. Uh, usually in those investment ranges, you're looking at uh, receiving twenty-five dollars to $150,000 either in equity, or sometimes just in grants that are a part of it. But usually that's a, a predecessor to our change organizations, but not always. Our Archangels get involved at the pre-seed and seed level. That's number three on the screen. And you see there, that's generally when the organization is still you know, pretty young. It's got a, a valuation somewhere between a million and $5 million. And um, the Archangels are in a position to be able to invest generally between 50 or 500,000 uh, in total. Now that's in a position to invest. I have to highlight because our individual members are looking at each of these deals, sometimes the investment is zero, uh, but at least those, that's the range that many times we, we participate in. I highlight the Series A and the Series B on this slide because so many people think that's always gonna be the venture capital money. And it's important to understand that from the perspective of St. Louis Archangels, we are very interested in becoming partners with you as you move forward. So while we may invest the first time at the seed level, we're very interested in staying the course with you. So as you grow, uh, achieve milestones, uh, improve the value of the company and move toward an ultimate exit, uh, needing additional funds, the Archangels will be very much interested in being involved with you in the Series A and the Series B rounds and we can sometimes invest pretty substantial amounts. So a recent example is three years ago, we had a, a startup come to us uh, when they got involved. Now, this was a little on the higher end. Our team was pretty excited. There were six people that were interested in investing. We formed an LLC. Um, six members joined that LLC, and we invested a total of $550,000. Last summer, in the Series A range, the St. Louis Archangels um, had additional members join that LLC in addition to the returning first-time members, and we invested a total of $1,850,000 out of a $4 million round. In addition to that, the Archangels have good network, and we attracted another million dollars worth of uh, money from our network on top of it. So almost three of the $4 million raised uh, came from the Archangels or the Archangel network, and I think that's important to highlight. 
a Series B round is coming up, and likewise, we're looking for the investors to be able to fund that round uh, to the tune of about a $5 million. So we have the, the capacity to do so, and it's important to think about that going forward. I put this slide up here because I think it's important to understand um, how we work and how we think. We call it the St. Louis Archangel Investing Flywheel. It's really important to understand that for our organization to be successful, our goal is to unite entrepreneurs with investors. And, and so to be able to do that, we have to have both. We need membership because membership has fresh capital, fresh capital, capital available to invest in the startup community. But to keep membership, we need good deals. We need deals that are interesting. We need deals that have the chance to be successful. And we do need some successes in that. So it's an intricate balance between the two to make sure that happens. Here's kind of how it works in our organization. So we have an opportunity for somebody to come and present. I usually see those deals and I look at those deals up front many times, uh, providing some feedback, some input, some mentoring to help improve the way the deal is presented. And sometimes that results in an improvement in the strategies around the deal as well. Um, when I think it's ready, it goes to our screening committee. Our screening committee meets be a week before our member meeting. Uh, and the screening committee takes a look at it and asks you to, on Zoom, will come in and present for a 10-minute presentation followed by a 20-minute Q&A. The screening committee's charge is to say, would our members be interested in seeing this deal, one? And two, is there a likelihood that they'd be interested in investing? If the answers to those two questions are yes, then the deal will move forward to our full member meeting where you will then come and present to our members in person. Again, a 10 minute presentation followed by a 20 minute Q&A, followed at the end of the evening by a networking event, which sometimes I think is the most important when you get a chance to speak to the uh, angels individually and recruit some champions for your, for your cause as you go forward, who will then talk to some of the other archangels. Um, Following that meeting, the due diligence takes place and deal team is put together for those people that are interested. We have tools that we prepared already like the LLCs. We can form an LLC in 30 minutes uh, to be ready to make an investment. Um, once we are involved with that, the, the, the deal moves forward. There's an investment that is made. Our team likes to stay engaged. They want information. They want to provide networking support to you. Many times that's in the form of some kind of informal mentoring, maybe a board observation role, maybe even a board position. We, we many times sit on the boards of these companies and the companies want us to. That's not necessarily our requirement. Sometimes um, it's the request of the company. In fact, most of the time. Um, we also, as I've already talked about, are a source for additional funding, not only with additional members of the Archangels and returning original investors as you have subsequent found, uh, rounds, but also our networking ability to move it forward. And then finally, we're all working toward the concept of an exit. I think that's important for you to understand. The Archangels are not interested in dividends or any of that sort of thing. Uh, we get our return through an ultimate exit. So we're patient in that regard, but we want to work with you to make sure we're moving in that direction. And we assess your opportunity from that perspective um, as well. This slide I put together just to highlight for you sort of how it works. We get our uh, referrals from accelerators, universities, uh, re re other relationships. We bring in about 130 a year. I look at those, uh, about 30 of those make it to our screening committee in any one year period of time. Our members then will take a look at it. There's usually 20 of them make them to our member meeting. Uh, from there, about half make it to due diligence. And that's not a precise number. It can be more than that. And, uh, and ultimately, roughly seven of those new deals will, will come out. It's important to understand that our members are seeing those deals that I just highlighted for you, which we call new deals, but they're also seeing the returning deals. So if you got funding this year and you need more funding next year, you would be, in addition to those 20 deals they're saying a year, you would be another one. So our members actually are seeing closer to 30 deals a year, 10 returning um, and 20 new in terms of the way we look at it. But it gives you a little bit of a sense in terms of our metrics. In 2022, we've already exceeded the seven and we're only halfway through the year. So it's been an exciting year for us. When we get through the, to the process of 
um, the investment and getting ready to do that, we go through due diligence. I put this slide up only to highlight some of the things I know many entrepreneurs are a little surprised about, but we these are the areas that we're looking into. We want to understand your product. We want to understand your team. That is very important. We want to understand your experience and expertise and who's advising you. We want to understand your go-to-market. We want to understand your uh, exit strategy, your competition, patents, um, and your financing strategy. Those are all really important elements of this. So I've covered a lot. There's more to cover, certainly, and I'm happy to have that discussion with you. Or if you have an opportunity, you'd like me to take a look at your pitch deck, I ask that you send it to me at this information, Brian Kinman, at that email address. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best of luck. And now for our second uh, investment in a row here, we've got Matt Foley, Program Director for Invest Nebraska. Hello, everybody. Thanks for jumping on this session. Uh, my name is Matt Foley. I was hoping to give a brief little primer about venture capital and risk capital when you're thinking about or in the process of starting an early stage venture. Um, but first, maybe just a little background about our organization. Invest Nebraska, we are a nonprofit venture development fund. So what that means is we partner and work very closely with our Nebraska Department of Ecom Development, and we invest in early stage startup companies. So on the right, you'll see some examples of logos of companies we've invested in here in the state of Nebraska. Um, and we've been investing for now over a decade and we've become one of the most active investors in the region. And another important differentiation about our program is this is an investment. This is taking ownership in the stake of a company. This is not a grant, um, which in other sessions of this program you've probably been hearing about. So when we think about some of the pros and cons of the capital that you go for, um, one of the things we'll be talking about is what does it really mean to take on investment from an outside investment group? But first, why would a government supported organization like Invest Nebraska, why would we be caring about early stage startups? And the truth is, this is a report from the Kauffman Foundation, but technology based economic development is becoming more and more important for our country. And it's entrepreneurs and startups, not necessarily the large businesses that are responsible for nearly all the net new job growth. So how do we how do we how do we support and how do we increase this innovation and entrepreneurship across the country? Um, and it's really three pillars of this of the stool. The first one is the opportunity infrastructure. So things like helping out with accelerators, incubators, and really programs like this, and that ties into education. How can we increase the awareness of what it looks like? And what are some of the steps to start a business? And then finally, the capital itself the money to start and, and begin to build a business. So when we think about the early stage of starting a company, it's not necessarily one path and it's not necessarily one fork in the road that an entrepreneur might choose. There are multiple ways to start the company. So let's start in the top left when we think about bootstrapping a business, just your personal savings, putting a couple early expenses on a credit card just to test out, does this business work? And now the SBIR program or early stage grants, um, if you're joining this, you're probably relatively familiar with this, but the federal government obviously has an incentive to see innovation in our country and our entrepreneurs. So they're supporting early stage entrepreneurs. And then sweet grandma, angel investors, people that are in your corner, family, friends, and fools, as they say, people that want to support your dream, support your vision, but they're probably not a professional investor. Another start of early, another type of early stage funding is Accelerators. So Techstars is an example of a really prominent early stage accelerator. With that capital, often comes a community and support system. And then finally, uh, Andreessen Horowitz is the example logo I threw on here, but broadly speaking, just venture capital. This is professionally managed early stage risk dollars that invest in early stage startups. So if you kind of tie all of these together, how does it fit in? Usually right out of the get-go, right when someone has an idea, they're self-financing their first couple of expenses, and maybe just their, their sacrifice of their time, they're just taking out of their own wallet. And as they start to have an early prototype and they're talking to some of their family and friends, they might have some angel investors and people in their corner that are supporting them. And then as the company starts to mature, that's where groups like Invest Nebraska and corporate inventors and other venture investors start to come in. And then later stage, as the company grows, you think about more traditional funding where you're working with the bank or institutional capital. For your type of industry, no, no matter, regardless of where you're working in, it's going to look a little bit different. If you think about starting a software company versus a biotech company, these things fluctuate a little bit. But generally speaking, the pattern, the, the timing, it is pretty consistent. We're out of the gate, 
and then we'll do early stage self-financing, some angel investment, and then eventually it lends to venture capital. The venture capital ecosystem, it continues to grow across the country and around the world. Um, this chart's a little bit out of date, but the pattern has continued into 2022. Um, more and more venture dollars are, are growing, more funds are being raised, and more investments are being really capitalized into early stage startups. So I guess my, my first piece of advice is a lot of times what we see is entrepreneurs become very tied to their idea and they really don't want to share it with anyone. Um, and at some point you've got to get over that learning curve and, and the expectation of you just got to get out and talk to people. And obviously, first and foremost, you need to understand your customers. But when you're starting to think about fundraising, one of the best things you can do is ask advice from the people you want to ask for money. And uh, this is a screenshot of the email that we received. And it was really well done. And basically someone was saying like, hey, they, they know very well that Invest in Nebraska invests in startups. But what, really what they asked for was, hey, we're just looking for advice. This is the first draft of our pitch deck. Can you give us some feedback? And it was a really great way to start the relationship because it, it was a soft entry. Then they're just looking for feedback on their deck. So today there's a little bit of a misconception of what are these investors to entrepreneurial relationships look like? People think it looks like this, where it's intimidating and you have five minutes to pitch and that five minutes is going to make or break your life. Where in reality, this is a coffee shop here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and it's one of my favorite coffee shops to take meetings with entrepreneurs because it purposely is a very laid back environment. And that is really what this looks like. You have the opportunity to, in your local ecosystem, probably meet with angel investors or, or groups that care about entrepreneurship and start to make those connections. And yes, there are gonna be some pitch competitions where you have your slide deck queued up on a screen and it's kind of your five minutes of fame. But in reality, most times it's a pretty laid back opportunity and it takes a two to three month period where you're building a relationship with an investor. But when you get that moment, what does it look like? And if there would be one most important slide to take away from the short presentation, it's this. What are investors actually looking for? And what do they care about? These bullet points on the right are the things that you need to articulate. And the style of presentation, it, it varies. I mean, some people might prefer a formal business plan where it's a 15 to 20 page Word document. More and more people, they don't wanna see that. They just wanna see a pitch deck. So they want to see you articulate on a series of 10 to, 10 to 12 slides, things like the why now? Why is the right time to start this company? Why will it grow? The market size, how good could it be? Um, and, and things like the competition, the product and the business model. So. What I finally want to wrap up with is from the investor's lens, what are we thinking about? What are we thinking about when we see these pitches and we're talking to early stage entrepreneurs? And there's really four categories of risk. And the way that we analyze these companies is it's a continuum and we're willing to accept some of these risks, but there's trade-offs. And I'm going to give a couple of examples, but the four categories of risk are market, execution, return, and technical risk. So on the market risk, what that means is, all right, this could be an absolute amazing piece of technology, but is a customer actually willing to pay for it? The execution risk, is this the right team to do it? They might have an incredible market that really wants this technology. The technology is amazing, but the team's only working on the project five hours a week. Are they really going to be dedicated to it? Uh, the technical risk, is this even possible? You know, the market might love it. The team might be amazing, but the technology is so far-fetched that it hasn't even been proven, their prototype, it really doesn't work. Is this technology even possible? And then the final one, the green circle at the bottom, this is probably the one where the entrepreneurs often misunderstand the most is, does this return even make sense? Will it be worth the investor's time and their money? So a couple of examples, and I should add, each of these companies are examples that, com that Invest Nebraska has invested in, um, and they're doing pretty well today, but in the early days, this is the type of risk we were monitoring and thinking about. So when we think about technical risk, a life science company or a therapeutics or a biotech company, if they could pull this off, and this is an example of a company developing a vaccine, if they could pull this off, it's pretty clear the market would like it. But again, back to technical risk, we weren't sure if they could pull it off. Uh, market risk. So this is an example of a company that was building travel software. Uh, building the software was relatively straightforward, but what we were unsure about is were the travel agents, their ideal customer, would they be willing to pay for it? Execution risk. So this is a company of a, in the drone space. And honestly, our biggest risk was 
the executive team, they were incredibly talented, but they're also super, super busy. So we weren't sure if they were going to have enough time and the bandwidth to actually build a successful company. Um, and then a hypothetical example on the return risk of it, let's say someone pitched us and said, hey, Invest in Nebraska, we want you to invest in our barbershop. The barbershop could be an incredible business, but just because it's a good business doesn't necessarily mean it's a great venture capital investment because we have to think about what are the types of companies that can create a strong return for us. So my final piece of advice, no matter where you are in the country, take advantage of your local startup ecosystem. As I talked about in the start of my presentation, more and more local communities, city and state governments, care about seeing entrepreneurship and there are programs out there to help you and most importantly get out of the lab get out of the office get out of the classroom you've got to get to know your customers and through that process you'll get connected to as i call them serendipitous supporters people that want to see you succeed and you won't have those people unless you get out of the typical lab or classroom and really talking to people in your corner so thank you for tuning in for this session my contact is available here and i hope you enjoy the rest, the rest of the program And now we have Decisive Point by Ryan Benitez, who's a partner over there. My name is Tommy Hendricks. I'm joined by my partner, Ryan Benitez, and we're Decisive Point, an early stage venture capital fund investing in security, energy, health, and infrastructure. Decisive Point supports early stage companies by working with them as they navigate the federal government ecosystem. From early stage R&D into transition into larger government programs, through non-dilutive funding and navigation of the compliance and contracting issues that are unique to working with the government. Over the last two years, we've captured over $250 million in non-dilutive capital for the companies we work with. 80 million of that went directly into our investment portfolio companies, making $14 of non-dilutive government funding for $1 that we invested through our private capital venture capital fund. We have a robust team of former federal contracting officers and people coming out of government that understand how to navigate the system, how to maintain compliance, and how to negotiate with the government, which drives a tremendous amount of value for the companies we invest in. Additionally, to our partners at Ensign, the Air Force, and the Navy, we support and run a number of acceleration programs that gives us access to great companies very early. The need for new tech in government has never been greater. Right now, we see in headlines across news every single day the threats that are facing our country. This includes not just the physical domain, but also cyber and the <clears throat> campaigns for influence. Decisive Point invests in eight primary technology domain areas, robotics, artificial intelligence, power generation, space, high-performance computing, health and human performance, human machine teaming, and advanced materials and manufacturing. We believe that these are the areas that the government will continue to invest in through down markets and as we continue to achieve our <clears throat> objectives in engaging on the international stage. I'm gonna turn it over to Ryan to talk a little bit more about our acceleration programs. Thank you, Tommy. Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Benitez. I am a partner at Decisive Point. I run our accelerator programs. One thing that makes Decisive Point unique as a venture capital firm are these accelerator programs that we have partnered with Ensign. So right now we are running programs in New York City, and we are also rolling out a program in Hawaii. I wanna take a little bit of time to talk about how you can engage with the program, whether you're a DOD mission partner, a government mission partner, an early stage venture, or maybe an industry partner. So we start our accelerator programming by working upfront with government stakeholders and DOD stakeholders to really understand what are the mission challenges they are facing? What are their top tech priori priorities? We iterate on problems with these partners, and then we go out and we recruit the best technology, the best startups from across the country to enter into one of our accelerator programs. We work very closely with our DOD mission partners and also industry partners to down select the companies that have applied. 
This is really important because the companies that come into the program are coming in with an established path, an established roadmap for them to work on during the program and for them to work on pilot projects, collaborative R&D with the mission partners that have selected them. So for the early stage ventures that are listening, I wanna talk a little bit about what the program entails. So our accelerators run anywhere from three to four months. And there's a couple of things we're trying to achieve with the companies in program. Number one, we wanna give companies the foundation that they need to navigate the complexities of working with the government and doing business with the DOD. We help them understand how to engage the right end users. What do you say with them? How do you communicate the value proposition of your technology? And how do you discover how your technology is going to, dis to solve their problems? We also help you navigate the acquisitions process. There are a lot of compliance issues and uh, other cybersecurity requirements that need to be met, things like ITAR. So we help you understand and learn about those type of compliance requirements when doing business with the government. We also provide a lot of opportunities through events and also virtually to interact directly with government end users and with industry partners. So you can start to set up R&D efforts, you can start to set up pilots and even test and evaluation efforts. So we create those opportunities for direct engagement and meaningful conversations. Lastly, we culminate our accelerators with a demo day. One of the other purposes of our accelerator program is to give early stage ventures access to trusted private capital. So for our demo day event at the very end, we bring in other investors alongside Decisive Point. We bring in other industry partners that want to know what you as the early stage venture have accomplished, what the roadmap is for you in government, and potentially provide an opportunity for you to seek investment. And most importantly, at the end of the program, you know, that's not the end. We have built out a very robust alumni community. We already have 28 companies that are part of this alumni community and we continue to provide support. You get to continue to leverage the many opportunities that Ensign provides and Ensign's network. And a lot of the companies continue to partner together as well with Decisive Point and with each other as part of this alumni uh, community. So. The bottom line is our accelerator programs are an opportunity for DOD mission partners to bring their problems to the, to the table, to find the best tech to solve them. It's an opportunity for early stage ventures to come in, show the government how you can solve their problems and how you can uh, have access to great capital. And then lastly, it's an opportunity to be part of a really great alumni community alongside Decisive Point and our partners at Ensign. So I want to stop there. I'll provide uh, some information on the, on the last slide on how you can reach out and get involved with us and our accelerators. Info at DecisivePoint.com. We want to hear from you, whether you're a mission partner from the DOD, whether you're an industry partner or whether you're an early stage venture and you wanna get involved in our accelerator programs. We have an upcoming program in Hawaii that is forthcoming. So please reach out. We wanna hear from you. Thank you. Coming now is Liam Crutt, investment partner at Reinforced Ventures. Hello everyone, my name is Liam Crutt. I'm a partner with Reinforced Ventures. We are a deep tech fund based in Pittsburgh, PA. Want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this talk, and I'll be going over how our fund works, the current NSIN companies that we have in our portfolio, as well as other companies that are in our portfolio that you might be interested in. So there are three things that we look for at Reinforced Ventures. I'm sure most VC funds would agree with these things, but these are the areas that we focus on. The first is irreplaceable competency. So we're looking for founders who are very technical, who have a niche set of expertise, and essentially, if they got hit by a bus, no one else could do what they do. So as we go through these different companies, you'll find that these people often have postdocs, 
or are in a very particular area of research expertise that is difficult to replicate with others in their field. The second thing that we look for are platform plays. So a technology that could produce, you know, 10 plus product lines or 10 plus cures to diseases. And then the third area is some overlooked technology. So a number of startups today are creating new types of batteries. So we might look into transistors. Um, in the biotech space, you might have a number of mRNA therapeutics. So we look at short hairpin RNA. Essentially, if it's an area that maybe is poorly defined or loosely understood, we'll bring in the niche expertise to deal with those. The team, we have two partners, Ewan Guthridge and myself. Ewan's background is mainly in the robotics and the autonomous systems space. Myself is mainly in the biotech, data science, and economics. Um, Ewan's a previous angel, angel investor. I've started two companies, one in the biotech and another in the cybersecurity space. Regarding that niche expertise I was referring to earlier, we have a network of over 1,500, almost 1,600 now, um, engineers, entrepreneurs, and scientists who will co-invest with us. Uh, we also rely on them for technical due diligence. So while you and myself know a lot of really uh, technical areas, we don't know all of them. And we often will pull in an expert to review and diligence those companies with us. Regarding our model, um, if you're curious to either send a steel flow or join our fund, we're very early. Uh, last quarter, we were the first check-in for two of the companies we invested in. Generally, we invest below a $20 million valuation, preferably the pre-seed round, but also the seed round. We'll do four investments per quarter, and then we'll also do a follow-on via that syndicate of 1,600 co-investors that we have. So regarding current companies that are also with NSIN, the first is Edge Case Research. They are essentially a big data company that um, provides insurance models for autonomous systems. So this would be, you know, fully autonomous vehicles, but also things like um, the piloting settings in your minivan or off-road use cases and defense use cases like they currently have in a Medium article you can read online with the Department of Defense. Uh, another portfolio company of ours, Catena Biosciences out of UC Berkeley, has discovered an enzyme and optimized it that can link proteins together in a natural state. So for drug delivery or new therapeutics applications, being able to take proteins together, link them like Legos is a completely fundamental new thing and totally wide playing field. And then the third, uh, that's worth mentioning is Acoustica Bio. They're a Harvard spin out that is using ultrasound waves to dispense high viscosity fluids. So that would include obvious things like honey, which is a sticky fluid, but as well as paints, sealants, preservatives, stem cells, monoclonal antibodies, the list goes on and on. There's a wide, wide array of um, applications for either 3D printing, 2D printing, dispensing into solutions. Um, so if you know, any of these three companies are of interest, feel free to reach out to NSIN or myself. We also have a number of companies that aren't in the NSIN portfolio, at least not yet. Um, they are all, it was really hard to make this list. I feel like a number of our companies are applicable. So please don't see this as top choices, but more you know, just kind of a tasting of portfolio companies. Again, feel free to reach out. My email address will be in the next slide and I'd be happy to put you in touch with any of these. So Volantra is actually our most recent investment. They have a new jet engine design that can take you from turbo to ram, potentially scram. So it's one jet engine that can do sub supersonic to hypersonic. Um, so for, you know, autonomous vehicle applications, for manned flight, for... Uh, uh, new rocket design. Their main use case is for um, essentially shuttling cargo and payloads to space at a tenth the price of current reusable rockets, but they are also selling their jet engines to um, other companies. Dawn Robotics is replacing QR codes and barcode systems with very flexible, data rich um, paper solutions that can be printed onto any packaging for quality control, can have instructions for three, for um, armed robots, or even for augmented reality 
applications. So as you can see in, in the second um, picture, there's a Nike label with a QR code. It's ugly, it's low data, it's difficult to use. The version on the right can contain you know, megabytes worth of data. You can flex it, you can tear it, you can turn it, you can poke holes in it, and it'll still work. Uh, the third company worth mentioning, EctoVR, they have robot boots that you can wear to walk in virtual reality. So if you have training that you need to do and you don't want to send people off site, uh, you can throw on a pair of VR goggles and boots and have your employees or personnel train in a 10 foot by 10 foot space for either you know turning knobs or any safety protocols that you need to go through for personnel training. Stark Therapeutics is a um, short hairpin RNA platform that has essentially found the cure for type one diabetes, but they also have multiple applications for performance, whether that's in military or space, right? So regarding muscle atrophy or maintaining a higher metabolism, uh, they have a non-genetically engineering um, system that can be very effective there. They're still looking for partnerships either in the military or space areas. And then the last one I'll mention, even though there's a long list of others I wish I had time to, is SAFA. So it, it's a artificial intelligence solution on Notre Dame that is able to take your software requirements and your, so, your source code and link them up directly to make sure that you're following all the safety cases and all the requirements for your software. So here's a couple links. If any of you are interested in joining our fund, I would be remiss not to include that. Um, if you'd like to schedule time with me to learn more about our portfolio companies or get um, in touch with them, feel free to use my calendar link or refer to my email address. It's just liam at reinforcedventures.com. And thank you so much. Again, there's, there's a wide array of portfolio companies we'll be updating to our website soon, um, but hope to hear from you all. Thank you. Coming up, we have once again LV with Sarah Myers, the CEO, to describe her experiences with Ensign Programming. Hello, my name is Sarah Myers, and I'm a professor of biomechanics at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, and I'm also assistant vice chancellor in the Office of Research and Creative Activity. And today I'm going to just give an overview of my personal experiences in the various Ensign programs that I participated in. So the first program I was involved in was the Defense Innovation Accelerator, which is now called Foundry. And I initially applied to this program uh, when I was encouraged by Wade Watts, who is the program representative that covers the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And he encouraged me to apply. And so I applied with a partner, Bobby Azuda, who had worked with me in my UNO appointment on some other applications that involve Department of Defense related technologies or applicable technologies. And so uh, just to give an overview, the process was quite rigorous. Uh, there was a written application followed by a one-way interview in which we were given a list of questions and we had to record ourselves and then submit the questions. It was quite an interesting process and then followed by a two-way interview. So once we were accepted as a team, uh, we were given an opportunity to review and rank the technologies that had been developed within the DOD and, and choose which ones we felt like uh, we were a good fit to, to work with. And then uh, our team was formed. So Bobby and I were on a team together and they gave us an additional teammate, uh, Julie. Uh, and then also assigned us a coach and a mentor to guide us through the program. The program involved uh, two phases. In phase one, it really gave an overview of the lean methodology. It was a six-week program, and we kicked it off with an all-day summit on a Saturday. And then we had weekly evening workshops, as well as weekly team meetings. 
I would describe this phase as almost exclusively customer discovery. We did 50 to 60 customer discovery interviews. And some of the, the resources or benefits that we got out of this phase one was developing our first pitch, uh, learning about customer discovery and actually learning how to carry out customer discovery. We also developed a number of contacts within the DOD as well as other members of the DIA teams. And we got to start that process of identifying potential tech use cases, especially those that might occur outside of the DOD. Our team did decide to move on to phase two. And phase two was 10 weeks long. The focus on customer discovery was a continual part of this phase. And I would say is likely something that's ongoing throughout the business life, regardless of the how old the business is. And so we, we continue to do this and refine what our potential markets could be. Uh, we worked a lot on our pitch and improving our pitch. And then we also started in this phase to get more resources in terms of business development, uh, how to form our company, developing a plan for funding, development, and commercialization in this phase. And so the benefits of this program were really to learn the entrepreneurial process. And prior to coming in, I really had not thought about being an entrepreneur. I had zero experience being an entrepreneur, and I felt that I had a good grasp of what that meant upon exiting this program. Uh, the DIA program also expanded my professional network, especially within the DOD, which has benefited our company that we formed, but also benefit my work at the university. And then I developed relationships with my team members, coach and mentor that have continued um, and have been helpful to me professionally. And then the other benefit was just being exposed to a lot of innovative DOD technology, which kind of plays into my ongoing innovation as researcher. Following the DIA program, uh, we did apply to the Ensign Vector program, which was described as kind of the next stage to the DIA foundry. And this program also had an application and acceptance process. I think it was fairly competitive. And it was a combination of asynchronous and scheduled programming. So there were a lot of materials online that we could uh, watch in our own time, which was really helpful. Uh, we had weekly office hours, so we could ask the uh, decode team, which administered Vector, uh, any questions that we had about the materials or even anything related to our business and applications that we were submitting uh, that they could answer. And so that was really helpful. Uh, and specific takeaways from the Vector program were to develop and refine a two-pager that we've used in many different avenues to share about our company. We did a lot of practice in refining of our pitch to various audiences, but especially to DOD audiences. Um, and related to that, we made connections with relevant DOD sources. We're able to share some of our business materials that were shared by those folks with their contacts. And then we didn't win, but we were able to compete for $25,000 in the Ensign Vector program. The next program that we participated in was the Ensign Maker program. And this is a prototyping program. And the application process is a little bit less structured, uh, but that flexibility actually benefited us quite a lot. Um, so we learned about this through the Ensign Transition Cell, I believe. And uh, our team, our company actually had a vendor who had already been producing prototypes for the original military sponsor. And so we worked with them and they agreed to produce two more sets of prototypes at the same price um, as a delivery for that original military order. And so the Instant Maker program gave us the flexibility to utilize that vendor instead of working specifically with different prototyping facilities that they had ongoing relationships with. Um, and then they also 
worked with us on the deliverables and contracting so that our company uh, that doesn't have a lot of operating capital right now could turn around and pay our vendor right before we executed the testing. And so at this point, we've submitted a purchase order and we have the funding for uh, the prototypes for our technology and we're waiting for delivery and hopefully uh, testing and development. So here is a picture of the LD device that we've been working with. And these are the prototypes that are um, being built. This is one that, that's already built and we're waiting for the second one for delivery. And with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to any questions that you might have. Coming up next is Amit Vasudevan, who is an Emerge alum, uh, cohort one graduate uh, representing UberSpark. Hello, um, I'm Dr. Amit Vasudevan, a senior computer scientist at Carnegie Mellon University and the founder and director of UberSpark Technologies, which is a dual use cybersecurity startup out of CMU. UberSpark Technologies was selected to be part of the National Security Innovation Network cohort one this year. In the next few minutes, um, I'll take you through a 10,000 feet view of our transformative and revolutionary tech, Modular Provable Security or MPS for short, and also summarize our experience with Ensign. Today's critical government cyber infrastructure is composed of multi-domain operations, space, air, land, maritime. They employ commodity, heterogeneous, interconnected computing platforms or chic platforms and associated software implementations to deliver rapid mission capabilities. Securing your mission against adversaries boils down to securing the myriad of chic platform mission software implementations. And this is tough because there are a plethora of components, complex interactions which make them prone to cyber attacks and render them costly, both in time and in dollars to secure and certify. This is evidenced by recent GAO reports that found vulnerabilities on satellite and weapon system software implementations, even after they were subject to rigorous testing and security certification. Current state of practice within DOD and government for platform security and certification primarily revolves around testing and runtime isolation. These approaches by design cannot provide complete coverage with respect to a given security property or security certification requirement. Further, there is combinatorial increase in the testing complexity, resulting in increased testing and certification cost when multiple system components are combined. To gain robust yet practical security on today's chief platform implementations, we need to take three boxes. In addition to being cost-effective and preserving existing functionality, we also need to take a third and important box, provable security properties. So what does provability buy us? mathematically backed security properties on software implementations. This means immunity against entire class of cyber attacks on existing mission systems and software implementations against any adversary. This is a very powerful feature and will help the DOD save money, be more agile and support the warfighter with new capabilities in a rapid and secure manner against inevitable adversaries. Unfortunately, none of the existing solution paradigms be it either testing or runtime isolation provide this today. Enter our solution, Modular Provable Security, or MPS. MPS focuses on incrementally securing the critical execution and communication paths within and across the chic platforms end to end. An example of such a path in a weapon systems could be opening the hatch, firing a missile, ensuring appropriate missile fin control to avoid any errant object except for the target. How do we do this? We identify chic platforms in the critical path that we want to secure. We protect implementation level components like memory, devices, and CPU states on those platforms with provably secure guards or proxies that we call Uber objects. We incrementally create and embed Uber objects by programmer friendly libraries within existing software implementations. And finally, we instantiate and anchor these Uber objects at runtime via a formally verified trusted execution environment on each participating platform. And all of this is tied together with our unique chic implementation level automated formal reasoning framework, which allows us to thread together security properties of individually verified components, even in the presence of unverified and untrusted system components end to end. 
changing a single verified component will only require recertification of that component, not the entire system. This will help speed up the process of security certification while still being able to deliver rapid and robust mission capabilities at low cost. Our MPS tech has the potential to dramatically increase cybersecurity, especially in safety critical systems spanning a variety of government and DOD segments, including the Air Force, Army, Navy, DHS, and DOE. Use cases that we see are provably secure sensor and mission processing to protect sensor data integrity and mission functionality, provably secure engine and weapon systems control for secure air, land, and sea vehicles, and finally, provably secure communication paths and data capsules for secure communication and data integrity and privacy for DOD cloud, homeland security systems, smart grids, and ground control stations. Our offerings are along three axes, MPS system support to infuse our MPS tech into existing mission software stacks, MPS runtime and development tool chain for developers to weave in MPS into existing DevSecOps pipelines, and finally, MPS enabled products and mission environments. MPS Linux, MPS Free RTOS, MPS Robotic Operating Systems, and so on. We are a pre revenue startup with eight years of strong R&D roots at Carnegie Mellon University and years of deep expertise in secure and trustworthy systems. Our MPS tech has been supported and funded by NSF, DOD, and more recently, NSIM. I'll quickly switch now to summarize our NSIM experience. This has greatly helped us with the formulation of our federally facing pitch. There were systematic weekly iterations that moved us closer towards the pitch you saw in the past few slides. Ensign provided us with helpful insights into the federal government DOD as a customer and how to do business with them. By the end of the workshop, we understood how this was very different from the commercial landscape. Ensign also provided guidance on how to formulate our federal two-page white paper technical brochure. This helped us really achieve a key balance between getting too technical versus promoting the value of our, of our solution. Now, we know that Ensign is still in the early stages, but we, we do feel there are a few things that can be improved upon and strengthened. From our point of view, we felt that we could have gotten a better exposure to potential end customers and stakeholders than what we ended up with. While there was a pitch day, we did not get the appropriate audience that we had hoped for with our live booth. Secondly, a true customer discovery experience was missing. Now we've been through the NSF i program before on the commercial side of things, and we had to come up with weekly summaries on how many businesses we interviewed, what they thought of our tech and so on and so forth. A similar effort would be great from a federal angle. All in all, I would say that the incident experience was very rewarding for us and we are more knowledgeable about potential federal customers than we were before the workshop. In conclusion, Uberspot Technologies is currently looking for DOD or government operational partners and customers for an opportunity to develop pilots to demonstrate our MPS technology at scale. Please contact us if you're interested and think MPS will be a good fit to secure your missions. Thank you. Next up, we have another Ensign alum, Mr. Don Soffer, who now works with Ascend Venture Capital. My name is Don Sofer, and I'm a second year MBA student at Washington University in St. Louis. And earlier this year, I had the opportunity to take the Innovation for Defense course, also known as Hacking for Defense, where different teams of students partner with different military installations across the state. And our team partnered with Whiteman Air Force Base in Knob Nostra, Missouri, and assisted them with a project throughout the semester, getting really hands on feedback and a hands on experience. And it was Really amazing to have the opportunity to visit the base, conduct you know, dozens of interviews with airmen, getting to see the B-2 bomber up close. That was really a unique opportunity. And by the end of the semester, we you know, collected our findings. We you know, conducted numerous customer discovery interviews and ultimately made a presentation to the commander of the base who offered really insightful feedback about our proposed solution. And I know the team there is going to be working hard to implement it in the semesters to come. And hopefully, we'll be able to hand it off to future students uh, as well to continue from where we left off. But as I've you know, had some time removed from this experience, I've been able to reflect on just, um, just what an amazing partner you know, Ensign has been throughout this process and how, off, how so often in entrepreneurship, um, I think the military and DOD gets left out of the conversation. I think what we really need to start seeing is entrepreneurs looking to solve uh, DOD problems and figuring out how we can get 
you know, defense experts, academic experts, and entrepreneurs all in the same room solving problems. And, that, and that's exactly what Ensign does. And they were really an amazing partner uh, throughout the course. And uh, especially particularly with the Unum platform, getting to see what other students were working on, getting to collaborate with them and learn the different um, you know, challenges that they were facing and how we could offer feedback on how to solve uh, and, and collaborate on different solutions. As I've gotten into my internship this summer, of, you know, even though the class has ended, I've still been in touch with Ensign, figuring out different ways as I've been working in venture capital about how our portfolio companies uh, can find ways to support DOD issues um, as well. And, you know, I, I want to just thank Mike and the team at Ensign for being such a willing partner as, as I've been working at Ascend Venture Capital this summer. And they've been so willing to offer um, offer resources, offer solutions, and find different ways to collaborate. I know that's what en Ensign's all about and just couldn't be more grateful to have them as a partner, both in my capacity as a student at WashU, as, as someone who took the Innovating for Defense course, and as someone who's now engineering this summer in venture capital at, at Ascend in St. Louis. Uh, Ensign's been just an amazing partner for entrepreneurship and we're, and we're so grateful to have their support. So thank you all very much and uh, best wishes for the entire conference. Going on to the final presentation within this section is Dr. Mark Rutherford, who participated in Ensign's Emerge program and works at the Washington University School of Medicine. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Rutherford from Washington University and St. Louis School of Medicine. And today I wanna to tell you about a drug we're developing to prevent noise-induced hearing loss in a program we call chemical earmuffs. More than 20 million Americans have occupations exposing them to hazardous levels of noise or recreations. Hearing loss, once acquired, is permanent, degrading situational awareness and quality of life. And studies of the elderly have shown that hearing loss increases one's risk of developing dementia. Yet, there are no approved drugs for prevention of hearing loss, a permanent disability highly prevalent among the American public, including veterans. In fact, the annual benefits report from the Veterans Administration reveals that hearing loss and tinnitus are the number one claim out of a total of approximately $99 billion in annual disability payments. Thus, prevention of hearing loss is critical for, for greater than 1.3 million veterans who suffer from service-connected hearing loss. Well, what if you could take a pill to prevent damage from expected noise exposures? Or if you could take an injection to rapidly intervene in an unexpected noise exposure? Well, that's where our technology saves the day. We've invented novel compounds that work to prevent hearing loss by antagonizing the actions of the chemical neurotransmitter glutamate, which is excessively released from the cochlea during noise trauma. The resulting excitotoxicity permanently damaged the auditory nerve fibers that connect the ear to the brain. And we prevent this, and the antagonism works at the level of the glutamate receptors. But instead of blocking all of these receptors, which would hinder hearing function, our drugs block only one type of receptor preventing the damage while leaving the other receptors active to mediate hearing function. So with funding from the Department of the Army Congressionally Directed Medical Research Program, Hearing Restoration Research Program, we discovered this solution in preclinical studies and we, pat we patented the technology. And now with phase two funding from the same mechanism, we're developing a drug for human consumption. We're a few years away from having a drug ready for testing in humans as we're currently undertaking safety studies for this first-in-class drug under development. As we develop a product, we want to talk to you about your specific use cases. Which populations of military personnel stand to benefit most from a drug to prevent noise-induced hearing loss? Under what conditions of exposure should our products be tested to address the largest unmet needs in active duty? We are seeking anchor customers to tailor our technology to the specific end user and we're seeking commercial partners to expedite our work and help license our technology. If you'd like to be involved, please get in touch with me for more information. I'm Mark Rutherford at Washington University in St. Louis, and my email address is rutherfordmark at wustl.edu. Thanks and have a great day. All right, we are now transitioning to our final section of the DES known as special presentations. We have Dr. Ruth Schumann, the Program Director for the National Science Foundation's i -Corps. Hello, everyone. I am Ruth Schumann. I am the Program Director at NSF, the National Science Foundation, responsible for the National i -Corps program. 
And I'm going to try to tell you in about 10 minutes a little bit about the National i -Corps Teams program today. All right, let me start with what is i -Corps. So i -Corps, if you're not familiar, is a seven-week entrepreneurial training program. The idea is that it is a, a process that you learn to help you evaluate the market or commercial opportunity of the technology that you are developing. We always say in i -Corps, we want you to get out of the lab and actually meet with people in your industry. And uh, during the pandemic, that meeting could be virtually, uh, as in a Zoom meeting, or it could mean that you actually meet in person. But we want you to actually meet with 100 people in your industry area. They could be potential customers, partners, or other stakeholders to learn more about your potential commercial opportunity. All right, the program basics are that this is a real world, hands-on experiential learning program. It was initially developed about 10 years ago by Steve Blank. We uh, worked with Steve Blank at NSF to modify this for academic researchers in particular. And uh, it is based on his Lean Launchpad course at Stanford. And we also use uh, the business model canvas that was popularized by Alex Osterwalder. And of course, again, it's to give you an opportunity to quickly assess your commercial interest in, and uh, feasibility. The program's mission is to help you reduce the risk associated with translating your technologies from the laboratory to the marketplace. And as I mentioned, this program has been around for 10 years now and uh, has really been an extremely valuable program, uh, especially for researchers to learn about their technology. The program is really aimed at uh, researchers in both science and engineering. And uh, this is not a program for people with a lot of experience in business or uh, MBA students, for example. This is really aimed at scientists and engineers. So if you are new to thinking about uh, commercial opportunities or entrepreneurship, this is an ideal program for you. It is really aimed at the people that are new to this area. All right, uh, the program is itself, again, aimed at uh, trying to help scientists and engineers understand their commercial opportunities, uh, especially if you've developed a core technology in science and engineering. It's also there to help address, again, the skill and knowledge gaps that you may have. Uh, it is not for those uh, people that have had a lot of experience. It's really for those of you that want to learn this i -Corps process and have a technology you've developed and you want to see whether it has a commercial opportunity. Uh, on the far right of the screen, it says companies fail because they develop something no one cares about. That is really the heart of this program. It is there for you to discover whether you have a solution to a commercial problem and whether that solution can be commercialized. Uh, and, the, and that is identifying customers and why they care about your potential uh, product. So uh, the eligibility, this is probably the biggest question I get. Eligibility, kind of complicated, I apologize. But uh, at the moment, you must have a technology connection to a university. You must be able to submit your application uh, from that university. And we often talk about a couple of eligibility pathways. One is you've had a prior research award with NSF that's related to the technology you want to explore in i -Corps. And this eligibility extends to anyone who's worked on the, on the project itself. Or if you don't have an award with NSF, you could participate in a regional i -Corps program. We have several hubs, nodes, insights. Our new program is our hubs program. And uh, if you uh, participate in a regional program, you may receive a letter of recommendation to a national cohort. So those are the two primary ways to participate. And actually, I encourage even our NSF lineage teams to participate in a regional cohort 
as it really gives you a great introduction to the i -Corps program and uh, really gives you a leg up when you arrive at the national program so that you can hit the ground running and be very productive right from the first day of the program. Let me just show you all of the uh, regional programs. So in case you're looking for a regional program, they're scattered all over the country. I don't have time to talk about all of them, but the probably the best bet is to look at some of our new hubs, which are the big red stars. Lots of institutions involved, but actually you may contact any of our programs. And this map again is located on our i team's website. So you'll be able to identify the institutions that are currently offering i programs. Uh, the next step for you uh, is really to form a team. Uh, the i program is unique in many ways, but one of the most unique aspects is that to begin this process, you need to form a team. And a team is uh, composed of three members, entrepreneurial lead, a technical lead, and industry mentor. So the entrepreneurial lead is typically a graduate student or a postdoc. They will be the leader of the team. It's someone who's been working on the project and who has an interest in commercializing the technology. The technology, or the technical lead rather, is typically a faculty member who serves also as the PI, but it also could be a postdoc with deep technical experience, but it's the typically a faculty member who has, whose laboratory has been uh, involved in conducting the basic research. And finally, the industry mentor, probably the most unusual team member, because we want you to identify someone from your industry with business experience who is not involved with the technology development and is willing to serve as a mentor on this team to help you through this process. So once you've identified the team, you'll submit an executive summary to NSF through our uh, national portal. And again, this uh, website is located, uh, this uh, link it rather is located on our website. And uh, then once you submit this information and the information you'll submit is information about your team, information about your technology, and maybe a little bit about what you think the commercial uh, interests are in your technology. Once you do that, you will be contacted for an interview. The interview process is an important part of our uh, process for accepting teams to the program. So you will do an interview with i staff. And then uh, during that interview, we'll remind you of your commitments. Again, uh, again, the commitments are that you will agree to conduct 100 interviews, you will agree to be able to attend all i core meetings and sessions, and that includes all team members, including your mentor. Uh, we want to uh, be sure that you are committed to learning this i core process and to commercializing your technology. And uh, if you're accepted, you usually will learn right at the end of your uh, interview. You will then be invited to submit a proposal to NSF. The proposal to NSF will uh, allow you to receive a $50,000 award, which you will use for your customer discovery activities. They could be used for travel or uh, virtual expenses as well as stipends. And then you will be allowed to select a cohort for participation. We are running about 12 national cohorts a year, three per quarter, winter, spring, summer, and fall. You will find the dates for the upcoming cohorts on our website, you'll be able to select the cohort that works best for your team, and then you will be added to the roster of that cohort. So uh, my last slide, finally, uh, I want to just remind you that for more information, please read the solicitation, uh, which again is posted on our website, the link to the, to the solicitation posted on the website you will be able to see the information on what you include in the proposal and what you include in that initial executive summary application. Here's the link also to the executive summary portal and our website, which has a lot more information about the program if you are interested. So thank you so much for listening to me. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me by email and I will try to get right back to you. And I look forward to receiving your applications. Thank you so much. We've got three formal presentations left to go. Next up is Ryan Micheletti, 
Head of Global Operations for the Founder Institute. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Defense Entrepreneur Symposium. My name is Ryan McLeddy, and I'm excited to share with you the Veteran Fund and our $100,000 Veteran Pitch Competition that's coming up in September and October. So really quick, um, I'm Head of Global Operations for the Founder Institute. I'm also a general partner at the Veteran Fund. Over the last 10 years, I've helped launch over 600 startups that have raised $200 million through my accelerator programs, and I've co-founded numerous companies. So at the Veteran Fund, our thesis is to invest in military veteran, military spouse, and dual-use startups um, based upon the leadership from exceptional founders of the military community. And so we're really here to be a resource to the entire veteran community, whether they're launching a company through an accelerator or if they're looking for seed or pre-seed funding, we want to be able to support those veterans and dual use companies throughout the entire life cycle of their company's journey. And so I'm supported here by our team of general partners, Mike Sherbikov, Justin Nahama, and Lisa Song Sudden, who are all globally recognized startup leaders and experts from the military community. And what I'm really excited about is the ecosystem that we're bringing together. So we're, one of our missions is to expand the frontier of innovation through this next generation community where we have top leaders from the military, like four-star general Stan McChrystal, uh, leaders from the business community and leaders from the mindfulness community like Deepak Chopra, who have all come in and either invested in the fund or are supporting the fund as a venture partner to help us build the next generation of military veteran leaders in the startup community. And so our core focus is to find, fund, and scale the top veteran-led and dual-use startups. Um, we'll write a 250K pre-seed check or a 500K seed check, depending on the stage and the round uh, that the company is raising. And then we leverage our vast ecosystem of partners, including the Founder Institute's global network, which spans over 200 cities and 6,000 portfolio companies to help those companies for life. And one of the things I'm most excited about is the $100,000 veteran pitch competition that we have coming up um, this uh, September and October. And so this is the second $100,000 veteran pitch competition we ran. Last year, we um, did one around Veterans Day where we had a keynote speaker from Mark Devine and we invested in a company called Candalytics, which is a dual use startup as well. Some of you may have heard. Uh, and for this year, we're going to run the semifinals online. So if you're a military veteran or, or spouse and you're interested in applying to pitch, you can go to www.veteran.fund slash pitch. And it's open to any military veteran or spouse um, who have raised less than two and a half million dollars in funding. The semifinals will be held online on September 15th. And then the finals will be held live in Las Vegas at the Military Influencer Conference on October 28th. So if you're interested to apply uh, to win $100,000, make sure you get your application in at the end of August by August 30th so that we can review the pitch and select the semifinalists who will pitch at uh, the semifinals on September 15th. And just a general call to action for the entire Ensign community, um, there's various ways that we can help support you as a now, whether you're interested in applying to the pitch competition um, or if you're a defense startup looking for funding, you can go to veteran.fund slash startup to fill out our intake form and then we'll set up a call with you to learn more about what you're doing. If you're a dual use or defense company that does not have a military veteran on the team, that's okay. We are open to looking at non-veterans who are building national security or dual use startups. So if you think you're a fit, please reach out to us. We're interested in talking to you and helping you build a company that can make a big impact for our nation's national security and defense interests. And the last thing, um, but not least, if you're an idea stage founder or if you're just getting started and you want to join a startup accelerator, the Founder Institute and the Veteran Fund have partnered together to launch our military and veteran um, uh, accelerator. Uh, if you go to fi.co slash veteran, you can see some details on that. Uh, it's a special program that we run alongside the Founder Institute San Diego, where we give veterans and military spouses free scholarships to join that program, um, where we help you through the idea and pre-seed stage to launch your startup. Uh, so if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, ryan at veteran.fund, and I hope uh, you have a great rest of your event. Thank you.
Coming up next is our last venture capital presentation by Yinka Filetti, who is a partner at Ascend Venture Capital. Hello, my name is Yinka Faleti. I'm a partner at Ascend Venture Capital. Ascend Venture Capital is a thematic venture capital firm that invests in data-centric tech companies that are building mission-critical tech that will power the future state of their industries or create a brand new industry altogether. We have 19 portfolio companies representing the span of the country from New York to San Francisco to Dallas to Nashville and right here in the great city of St. Louis and other great cities. Our portfolio is comprised of companies like Oxio and Arbol and Freightwaves and other terrific companies with transformational tech that is powering the future state of their industries. Our Fund One Vintage is from 2015, and it is currently, uh, you know, currently at an IRR of 28%. And we since raised Funds Two and Three. We just closed on Fund Three earlier this year, and we're currently investing out of Fund Three. We're bullish on the future. You know, as you know, whether you are a startup or whether you're an investor, it's well documented that. That venture capital is the uh, one of the two big ways that we get innovation in our country, and in terms of of uh, private dollars, it's it's the number one way. So we think of companies like Netflix and Google, and and uh, uh, companies of the like. They all at some point, Amazon. They all at some point had their start and were backed by venture capital firms. And so venture capital is the way that we propel our society forward and we move forward as a country technologically and in terms of progress. However, the problem, one of the problems in venture capital is that we're only funding half of our brain. Well, this is what I mean. In 2021, venture capital had its best year since it began in this country in the early 70s. In venture capital throughout this country, $330 billion was invested by venture capital firms and companies all over the country. Of that $330 billion, only 3% went to companies founded by women, and less than 1% went to companies founded by a person of color. And this is problematic on two fronts. One, we're leaving a lot of money on the table because companies founded by women, people of color, and, and others, and other underrepresented founders have great ideas, transformational companies that can uh, enrich investors and, and communities and employees and the like. And the other problem with that is it's creating a, a lot of uh, lack of innovation because what idea, what problems could we have solved had we funded uh, companies that were founded by underrepresented founders. Could we have potentially cured cancer by now and other persistent problems in our society because we're only funding half of our brain? And, and we think that's that's not right. We think we need to do better than that. We think there's an opportunity here. And so we are using fund, a new $25 million opportunity fund. And this fund would go to fund founders in our portfolio primarily uh, who are women, uh, someone of color, someone who is an immigrant, or someone who identifies as LGBTQIA+. And so that's what this $25 million fund is principally for. And some of it will go to companies uh, that we have not yet met who will meet that criteria of being founded by a woman, a person of color, an immigrant or someone who identifies as LGBTQIA+. Ascend Venture Capital did not begin with this mandate. This is this was not a mandate of our, of our firm, but we saw something happening that was uh, emblematic of what's happening in the broader economy, something happening within our portfolio. We noticed that eight of the 19 portfolio companies that we have are founded by a woman or an immigrant uh, or, or someone who... Uh, who identifies as LGBTQ plus or, or someone who's of color. And so we, we saw that that's 42% of our portfolio. In addition, we saw that 
64% of our capital is going into those companies. Why? Because of the first rule of venture capital, you double down on your winners. And these were by and large the companies that were winning in our portfolio. But we shouldn't be surprised because from Forbes to Pew Research, the data is legion. The companies founded by diverse founders outperform by up to 63% better, better valuations and so on than companies founded by monolithic founders. And so Ascend Venture Capital is leaning into this opportunity with this $25 million opportunity fund. So we're looking for founders who fit this criteria, who have transformational uh, companies, transformational ideas, they're building mission critical tech that will power the future state of their industry or create a brand new industry altogether. And we're looking for investors who believe in this thesis that every company, no matter whether they are a logistics company, whether they're a telecom company or, uh, no ma or a healthcare company for that matter, every company has to become a data company because that's what's driving the future. And so we're looking for investors who understand that and see an opportunity to invest where others aren't looking, but where there's opportunity for great alpha. And so we're really excited about our future. We're bullish on our future. And, you know, as a veteran, uh, I served six years active duty in the U.S. Army. As a veteran, I understand the power of diversity because what has made the United States Army the most powerful force for good in this world is our diversity as an army. When I was a, a soldier uh, and, and I left the army as a captain and, and leading soldiers, uh, I served with soldiers who were of Asian descent, of, of German descent, of African descent, of, of Puerto Rican descent, Latinx soldiers, African-American soldiers, uh, soldiers of every color and hue under the sun. And that's what made our army strong. And so I know the power of diversity, and we know it from all of the research and all the data out there, and we see it in our own portfolio. So whether you are a founder or whether you are an investor, uh, consider ascending with Ascend Venture Capital. Thanks for your time, and hope you have a great rest of this symposium. Talk soon. And now we are on to our last formal presentation of the Defense Entrepreneurial Symposium. So taking a cue from uh, the previous presentation, uh, we have a presentation known as Diversity Unlocks Innovation presented by Karen Frey, uh, Ensign's National Service Portfolio Director. Off to Karen. Hello everyone, I am Karen Frey, the Director of the National Service Portfolio with the National Security Innovation Network, INSIN. My portfolio represents talent, and it is our mission to create new opportunities that account for generational and cultural differences between the military, academic, and venture communities, and that provide flexible pathways to official service within the DOD. The structure under which INSIN applies DEI and A initiatives in the National Services Talent Focus Portfolio can also be applied to the entrepreneurial and venture portfolio. Both require a bold stance in the effort to create and sustain diversity, equity, and inclusion practices and open access channels for unrepresented founders. But this mission goes beyond just exposing talent to model and pathway opportunities and then believing that they will become a ready and capable workforce. The effort and responsibility to protect our national security has to be steadfast. It has to be intentional. It requires views from all perspectives, which goes to ensure our strategic advantage on the global stage. It requires a wide range of skills in numerous disciplines and tech verticals. How else can we apply multiple views of courses of action to approach innovation and challenge that status quo? It requires more than a singular homogeneous view of a problem. How else can we appreciate different thoughts and perspectives and find new ways to approach a problem? In the most basic of terms, it requires diversity. Diversity unlocks innovation. 
The old saying coined by psychologist Abraham Maslow says, if your only tool is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. It refers to an over-reliance on one way of doing and seeing things. Ensign's engagement with talent recruiting and early stage ventures is not built on that mindset. It is built on the foundation that bringing the best ideas to the table rules the day. Innovation happens when teams challenge the status quo, when they look beyond the obvious and work creatively. How do you build that team? How can the DOD explore faster ways to attract, hire, develop, and empower talented individuals who are well-suited and well-prepared to face the challenges that impact our national security? Some, thought, some thoughts to doing this are, increase the objectivity in your selection process. Be more intentional about closing the funding gap. You wanna make sure that you are hiring and bringing on the best talent. Explore new places for talent, when you create clear, inclusive, and high intent postings, advertise jobs in, and opportunities in diverse networking groups and job boards. And then once you've assembled your talented team, educate and empower everyone from leadership down on how to create an atmosphere where everyone feels included. As I stated, this effort, it has to be intentional. It has to be responsible. It is not simple. This is how INSIN strives to unlock innovation with diversity. Acceleration programs such as Start and Propel make endeavors to connect startups to the DOD and strategically impact economically challenged areas and talent. See, the key word is talent. We don't move the needle forward on the workforce pipeline without talent. The National Service Portfolio is working to build bridges through the engagement of our 11 regions, to expose top talent to the DOD through our programming models and pathways. Every opportunity, whether it's by spending a summer internship or a one-year fellowship or through periodic volunteer opportunities, and certainly through direct hiring programs, the National Service Portfolio is extending its reach to diverse talent everywhere and placing them directly with the mission partners to provide solutions to the DOD's critical problems but the experience also gives a participant an eye into what civil service is like. And at the same time, it exposes the DOD mission partner to a diverse cohort of student talent, which makes for a potential hire to fuel the workforce pipeline. Imagine as a young professional or student being able to work on challenging programs in the defense industry, and not only in a new environment, but also with varied personnel and ranks, and then gain exposure to the DOD mindset and environment, but then imagine also having your ideas adopted into this new space. This intentional interaction and show of inclusion among these diverse individuals impacts personal interests, life experiences, social interactions, and it develops soft skills spanning from emotional resilience to strategic design. When recruiting for great talent, the effort has to be intentional because it carries such a massive responsibility to our national security and our warfighters. Diversity of thought, diversity of talent, diversity of knowledge, diversity of life experiences, they all comprise a diverse environment that unlocks innovation. I would like to thank the Defense Entrepreneurial Symposium keynote, St. Louis Mayor Jones, who has named the week of August 7th, National Security Innovation Week. Thank you all for listening. That concludes our last formal presentation of the DES. And on behalf of Ensign and our delivery partners, the SBDC in Missouri and the Nebraska Business Development Center, I'd like to thank you for attending today. Hopefully you've gotten a lot out of this. We've tried to expand things over the previous year where we've had investors talk to you and everybody cares about money. How can you lose on that? Uh, a couple of reminders before we disappear for the day. Uh, number one, uh, up in the top corner there of your screen, you'll find some links. Uh, you'll find links to a virtual expo or what we call the booths. Uh, in booth number one is Ensign, so that's open for an interactive Q&A. So if you have questions, you can go there. Uh, booth number two has the Cyber Q&A. So if you have questions about how to apply for a Cyber, what's what are some really great uh, 
best practices and strategies to secure funding. Those are the people to talk to in booth number two. Total of 13 booths. Some of them are uh, have uh, websites, uh, excuse me, not websites, uh, web enabled video chats uh, up and available. Some of them don't, but you can email uh, companies directly, no matter what type of uh, interaction they have at their particular uh, booth. Uh, so you can always uh, get the word out and, and ask questions either face to face to face from a virtual perspective or through an email. Uh, also, don't forget, please fill out our survey. Uh, we'd like to hear what went right, what went wrong, what stuff you want for next year, what improvements you'd like to make. That's always important, uh, what you want for next year. Other than that, we're at the end of our time. So once again, thank you for attending the DES, and we look forward to seeing you next year.